hand. That little hand to move. The big hand to move, actually, right? <laughs> First item is uh, for the public. Anything that's not currently on the agenda? Anybody? No takers? That's good. Next, we have approval of the agenda. Uh, if I may request from the board uh, one change that did not make it on the agenda it is a ratification of the select board granting the authority to the town treasurer to send tax bills out. Uh, the board had passed this via email, had board members come in and sign the letter, so we had signatures and we would just need to have it uh, ratified. Okay. Can we just add that to the consent calendar? Sure. We're at ratifying the treasurer's authority to send out tax bills to the consent calendar. The other thing, uh, since we have people here for a variety of things that are scattered all through the agenda, is if we come to an item and we have nobody waiting on it, we might bump it to the bottom of the agenda. Mm -hmm. Just to keep the crowd portion moving. Sounds good. So we might put stuff on hold and move to it later. And I'll probably cross a few things out. I can't want to talk about those. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> I've been known to when I scribble all over it, though. Great. A motion to approve the agenda? Oh. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained. Motion carries. Next, we have the consent calendar, which is meeting minutes, warrants, cemetery plot, and ratifying the board's uh, motion to give the treasurer permission to send out tax bills. Your turn. All right, I move. We approve the consent calendar. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. <clears throat> New business. First up, we have a briefing from EC Fiber. We have, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, just, to the, just to share some information with the board, this is a part of the ongoing conversation regarding the request to establish a, a ready district. Uh, within a neighborhood of the town. Um, for the board's request, we reached out to EC Fiber and invited um, Carol, the executive director, to come in and speak to the board about EC Fiber's work, some of their priorities, and then also to speak briefly um, on potential relationship, if any, between EC Fiber and a ready district. So, you have Carol? Okay. Shall I? Oh, perfect. Okay. Um, um, so, EC Fiber is the East Central Vermont Telecommunications <coughs> District, and it's a district of 24 towns, of which Randolph is one of those towns. And its mission is to uh, build fiber to the home, internet access to all the premises in those 24 towns, but starting with those areas that are least served. And so, the areas that are densely populated with cable have a choice already today. Um, whereas other areas do not. And so we're building the, the outskirts before we're building the town areas. Um, <clears throat> and we have been building in the last three years or two years, 250 miles a year. Um, our intent is to have 1,400 miles of fiber complete by the end of 2020. Um, and that would include all of the outskirts of Randolph. So that the cabled areas we will get to after that. Um, those We understand the need to have a competitive um, situation in those areas, and so that's not, you know, we certainly will cover those, but that's at the end of our initial build. Um, we've built 700 miles thus far. We have another 700 to go. Um, it's been uh, a great process. For all of you who, who, who have followed EC Fiber, <coughs> you know that the first, um, 
300 plus miles was built with individuals contributing 20, in $2,500 increments for us to be able to <coughs> build to, the, to their areas. And when we were in that process, you, you know this kind of spider web effect. Um, that's where we were three years ago. But now we have whole towns built. We're continuing to build whole towns in the most rural areas and the outskirts of towns, sort of the, the donut of, a, of the town, um, in, in other areas. So this past year, we announced that we would be building in 2019. We have to always be 18 months in advance in order to get access to the polls. But in 2019, we'll start construction in four towns to complete those towns. But then an additional 80 miles of fiber will be constructed in areas just like these areas, meaning areas in which there is a great need, um, but not, um, uh, but not, but, but because it can't, it's not the whole town. Um, we left these 80 miles to make sure that we could cover some of these areas that have a great need, but are in towns that have a cable franchise, but not necessarily in these areas. Um, but in any case, our commitment is to have all of these unserved areas finished with a fiber to the home solution by the end of 2020. And so that's the direction we've headed. Our capital builds are, are financed with revenue, financial um, municipal revenue bonds. Um, we don't ask the towns for any financial help in doing this. Um, we have been able to uh, receive revenue bonds uh, for three years in a row. I think it's uh, right around 30 million thus far. So there's no individual here in this town that is taking a risk. Um, and we all know that once we're complete with these builds and are settled as a district, um, then, the, then the conversations amongst, um, within the district will be about, do we lower rates? Do we provide for um, so, uh, those that are, that are more economically struggling so that everyone can have access? You know, so what is it that we're going to do after the, we complete the builds and, and we have excess revenue? So that will be the step that we look at. In 2021, we'll be looking seriously at a different business plan for the cabled areas. So just to give you an idea, in the unserved areas, our take rate is generally about 40%, 50%. Um, and it costs us about $30,000 a mile to fill. In the cabled areas, it costs us about forty to 45000 um, miles to build a mile. 40, 45,000, yes, to build a mile. And it's about a 17 to 20 percent take rate. Yes, they're more densely populated, so it's a whole different business plan. But that's our intent, is to start looking at that when we get to that point. Um, so th when I look at this district, and the, and the purpose of the district, I'm a little concerned that there is similar, um, there's a similar reason for wanting to create the district. Um, to get uh, this area covered, which, we'll, which we will be covering, and, um, and to make sure that you understand the timing of trying to bring something like this together. So when I, when I said it takes at least 18 months, it's because it takes at least nine months to a year to get permission to be on the utility poles. So even when you start the process, after you've collected all your poles, after you've um, done the design and engineering and you've submitted your pole applications, it could be a whole other year before the current utility pole owners allow us to be on the poles, license us to be on the poles. And then it takes another six months or so to build in a given area, six to nine months, to build about 250 miles. So it's a long process. And by the time you were to start this process, we would be done with it. I guess that would be my take on that. Now, sure, there are some there are some things unknown. You and I both don't know what this economy will be. Right? Hopefully, we won't see a thousand people. Um, what we learned in the last bond revenue bond market is because um, because of the changes to the economy and and some of the taxation, we were actually able to sell our municipal bonds at, in the market in less than two days because there aren't a lot of municipal bond offerings out there. And 
so we mostly the, the entities buying our municipal bonds are insurance companies, uh, financial institutions, you know, uh, those types of uh, long-term investment uh, buyers. So yeah. if we were to, this ready district wants to come in and be created, and it would give them the ability to basically tax themselves or charge a fee to themselves to pay for this infrastructure. What's the downside to us allowing them to do it? That they are spending funds that they don't, they don't need to spend. But it's their money, right? Um, it is, and if it were to occur, then that would be an area that would be covered and we wouldn't need to do that. So they're kind of helping you by getting that area up and going quicker. They're not helping us. So you don't have to then focus on that. You can focus on another area. So that I needs guess it would be to, be to what, what would have to happen is they would probably go out with an RFP. Others would respond. There's, and, and there's no guarantee that, that we would be their choice. And, um, and now you have this entity responsible for a utility and looking for an operator unless they choose to have a Comcast or a CCI be that entity. Any other entity would be looking for an operator. So it would either do one or two things. It would either, it's not gonna be helpful to us because we're, that's not funding that we would normally um, be using at this time. And, it, and if they chose to go a different route then we would just be removed from the district. I mean, there would be no need to it. They would be served like the cabled areas, right? There would be no need for us to be focused. So it doesn't really have a negative impact on you. It allows you to focus your resources somewhere else sure. if they're going to answer there. But you end up in these, in these towns, which the towns are all part of, you end up with um, a economic development district that's different than the rest of the town, that's different than the rest of the 24 towns that we serve. Mm -hmm. So it's altogether a possibility, but I don't know why individuals would want to raise money and pay for that by way of what taxation of some sort when this is a network that would be built without that. If they can go out and get somebody to work with them and install it so quickly, is that an option for you to go out and work with these other entities that can get the lines installed quicker? You, um, unless it's unless you're dealing with the entity that owns those poles, mm -hmm. then the option or the opportunity to get it done more quickly <laughs> is slim. Because any other entity besides those that own the poles will need to do their survey, do their engineering, submit for submit their applications to be on the utility poles and be at the mercy of the utilities to get that work done in time. And so that's the reason I, I, I explain that because whether they create the district and it's done and they've created and they've raised funds, you're now looking at the middle of next year by the time, I'm just being realistic here. Mm -hmm. Unless, of course, they know of somebody now who has that funding available. And then another 18 months from there, there and you're already at, an, at a timeline that we would already have done the work. If that was in your priority queue. Right? Every area that's not a cabled area, densely populated cabled area, we do go through some cabled areas because we have to go through them to, to reach these other areas. Um, is in our queue to be done by the end of 2020. So do you have a map that might show us what you've applied for permits for and, and a timeline? So they go, okay, this is where we're going next this year, this is where we're going after that, and this is where we're going to that. Do you have something like that? We know, we know that we're down to, um, so list off the towns that are being built currently that are under mm -hmm. construction. And you've, you've created some network here, so somewhere it must be mapped out. Right, it's not It's not mapped out. It, um, it's mapped out a year, 18 months in advance, a year right. in advance. But right? that's something we can take a look at? Right, so in the next year, 2019, the construction <laughs> will begin in Berkshire, Sharon, Royalton, Tunbridge, plus 80 miles 
of network, which hasn't been decided but will be before November 15th, of network in exactly these areas. So towns that, that don't, that aren't, aren't, that have a cabled center but need access on the outskirts. But this road then, this district must be on that 18 month plan. Yep. So there just are two things about this district that are quite change. interesting, and I'm going to, I'm just, I have a couple of maps I'm going to leave with you. One is a map that shows, you'll see, and I'll leave it with you, it shows blue dots on it. And these are the locations that the state of Vermont has determined are in need of high-speed internet access. And when you look at, um, when you look at those areas, you'll see exactly where they want this ready district. The second map, and this is one of the reasons, this is how we determine where we're going next, is the same area, and the red dots indicate who has expressed interest in EC fiber. I'm going to say, there's a little bit of market study going on here too, right? So, we know who has expressed interest in that area for EC fiber, and our, the two things that we look at when we determine where to build next is how many from how many individuals in that, that area has expressed interest and how much of a need is there. So when I look at the two maps and I overlay them with each other, the, the, there's certainly a need. The state of Vermont has identified that as a need. And, but there's not a vast majority, the yellow dots, by the way, are premises. It's not, there's not a, a vast majority of people expressing interest. And so, if there had been, it might have been on our list sooner. Mm. So how do you determine if they're, so do these people call in to no, ask this? They go online, how they subscribe, yeah. sent out postcards in the past, and okay. put ads in the papers, and, uh, and, uh, and we did a crowd fiber campaign two years ago. So do they call in, or do they mail something in? No, they, they, they can go online and just subscribe. There's no... Um, so if none of these folks have the internet access, they'd have to do it? During the day at work or something like that. Or they like could that. call in and we will enter it. So there is a we call. have done that before. Most people have access at work or at the library or someplace else. But it asks questions in which we want them to commit to. You know, it's not a commitment like a financial commitment, but it says we understand someone will come to our house to do a survey. We want them to be aware that we'll be doing that. Those sorts of questions that, that they need to answer. And at the very end, it says I've answered all these questions off you to the best of my ability and so on. Um, so that's why we'd like them to, to do the subscription. So <coughs> I, I'm looking at that area and seeing a great need and not a lot of people expressing interest. Some, but not a lot. And so as a proportion of the houses that, 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 that need it, that expression of interest is low compared to other places? Right, so when, we, when I look to where we're going to build, I'm looking at need, and expression of interest. And, and it, I, when I say that, it doesn't mean that they won't get built. It just means that those areas that have a greater need and a greater expression of interest get built. So you, is it fair to say you have 80 miles of cable, you haven't decided where it's going to go yet, and if these people suddenly lit up your website, so, you me, might see that become a top priority you, for the 80 miles? Let me tell you a, a really quick story, and this just happened last week. There's an area in Hartford, believe it or not, that doesn't have cable. We call it the Jericho region, but it's really the area north of 89. And some individual put out on their listserv that we were very, you know, that we're looking at where we're going to build these next 80 miles. Um, on Thursday of last week, and we have had 30 subscriptions, 33, since Thursday in that region. So yes, that, that could occur. I've been looking at this region for quite some time. It's not just the Randolph region. It really it's Bethel and Randolph based on where the utilities come from. And um, so it's northern Bethel and southern Randolph. Um, so that's, uh, that, that, that's been on our horizon. Um, it's about 47 miles of fiber. Um, if I include east of 89, it's 57 miles of fiber. Um, but it's not an impossibility, and it can be done in two in, in two tranches. But, it, but all of it will be done by the end of 2020. 
assuming the utilities do their work, even if I give them a year. <laughs> so sometimes these projects extend, but um, but that's that's really the goal to have them done by 2020, the end of 2020. Gotta be careful. Yeah, yeah, it's a big difference. Yeah. So I, you know, it doesn't matter to us whether you decide that it's an economic development, rural economic development area uh, it makes sense here. But I'm just telling you where C Fiber is headed and what All right. All good. Any other questions? Any questions? I'm set. Mr. Worth. I just have a question that kind of follows on Trini's question about whether I hear Carol saying that, by the way, I'm a delegate from Randolph for EC Fiber, so, so um, Carol and I share a lot of information. But um, I hear that EC Fiber would not be hurt by whatever the town decides about this district. But I wonder if you look at the perspective of Randolph as a town, would Randolph's chances of being picked in the next round for an all-town build-out be adversely affected if another area is kind of plucked away the way Comcast has plucked away some areas? We would focus our efforts on those areas that are not served, that are not served or underserved. I think that's a yes. So um, in the same way that we would put this center of Randolph, um, towards the later end of our builds, we would put that out there as well. So to put that in perspective, is that <laughs> the town might be hurt somewhat in its chances, but on the other hand, the people in that new district would presumably get some service sooner, or at least they think they would, and might get a section of town would get better service than the rest of the town might be hurt. That's, yep. that's how I'm choosing to yep. interpret if, it. If they chose a carrier that already owns the place. How would the rest of the town get hurt? Because if the rest of the town wouldn't get service. It's just that one portion of it. The rest of the town would still be shown as not served. Is, is it a volume of unserved that you have to have to focus? No. Um, I, what this, I mean, when I look at this area and I look at the way the utilities feed this area today, some coming up from Bethel, and some coming down from uh, Route 66, so from that intersection. Um, I, you know, it takes out a piece of the town that may indeed serve other areas. I don't know if I can explain that correctly, but your utilities follow a certain pattern, and, and now if we build to this edge of the district, right, and yet the utilities feed the same utilities feed on the other side of the district, and that creates a challenge. So similar to if I'm going to feed a piece of Randolph and have to go through the center of town, and there are some areas in which we're going to have to do that. Well, the situation is a little different in Comcast because I'm one pole away from Comcast and I can't get service, but I'm right down 66, and there's other residents in the same boat there. So, but you don't have a plan to come that way. So 66 between what and what? between Randolph Center and, say, the interstate. So I'm one pole away from Com Comcast. Can't get Comcast to connect me. So Comcast so I, doesn't go all the way to the interstate? One, no, Comcast goes right up 66. And they've got <laughs> they're one pole over here, and they're serving one residence, and there's two more beyond us. They won't service. I had a conversation when I met with, I talked with down when I went to Windsor to chat with you folks when you were talking about communications when the governor was there. And I've heard nothing yet. No one's gotten back to me about it. They said, oh, well, maybe we can help fix that. Well, and nothing's occurred. So, but you folks aren't going down 66, are you? At this moment in time. Right now you're not. No, but for us to serve, <coughs> uh, you're more familiar with your town in many ways. And, you know, I look at it on a map all day mm -hmm. long. But for us to serve the area that's, um, that, that's, that's sort of north <coughs> of, 66 as it comes into town, right, and um, and east of uh, Braintree, mm -hmm. um, we have to go down 66, and so we will be doing. You'll be going down 66 eventually. 
Because right now you're going across the interstate bridge north of 66, correct? We're going up much further north. Right, you're, you're crossover much further. You're north. on the crossover right up above. And that was part of the building. That was to pick up that neighborhood, those neighborhoods up there. And that actually was uh, the funding for that is through the broadband business um, district uh, through the state. They mm -hmm. built that. Right. We have uh, 48 strands of fiber on it, but they built it. Um, more questions for the board? Yeah, just one other. So I guess what you're saying is, <clears throat> by the end of 2020, this area where where folks want to create a possible ready district, it's going to be served by EC fiber, one way or the other. Right. And so the residents in that area, <clears throat> um, at some, at, they're, they're going to have access to to to, to, to fiber through EC fiber sometime between now and then, no matter what happens. Provided they haven't contracted with someone else to bring them fiber to their home. Okay, and so if they do, then they could pot, then they would have to wait until you start working on the, 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 the districts, that, the areas that are already served by, by right. some sort of broadband. By but some would, sort of real broadband. But, but they would get it eventually. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Next up on the agenda, we have the board candidates for the school district. Uh, this is a part of an ongoing conversation. Um, we, as a reminder, we, we've had two members of the um, OSSP board Later. resign. And a part of the process um, mandates or at least requires um, um, input from the select board. Uh, so I've been working with uh, members of the OSSD board. We have Paul Putney here today, um, and he's agreed to answer any questions. We also have, I've seen at least one member uh, or one person who submitted a, a letter of interest. Um, and then also we had an email message come in today from someone expressing interest in the position as well. Um, but you know, I'll leave that to, to Paul uh, to answer questions about their required process. So. Okay. So, uh, uh, yeah, hi, I'm uh, Paul Putney, I'm the Vice Chair for the School Board, and essentially uh, we had two people step down, and the process in order to, the process in order to fill those is the, the select board for our town, because we have three towns, if it was from another town, Brookfield, for example, Brookfield would select it, but in this case it's Randolph, so we need uh, three candidates need to be boiled down to two. You make, you say we like these two people to be the candidates to fill the slots and then our next school board meeting we would uh, appoint those two candidates um, as long as there wasn't something that we saw that we said, you know, hey, these two candidates are unfit to serve. But from all we've seen, I, I was unaware of the fourth person, but the three people that have submitted the names um, look like they're fine professionals and would do fine on the school board. We have no reasons to not accept either one of them the three. The only one that stands out to us is Ann Kaplan, just because she was uh, on the board already for a number of years and knows the process. And we already have two new board members from the last election, and so if we have two more new ones, it'd be nice to have somebody who was previously on the board to help us with the uh, processes and stuff. So we'd have essentially one new board member instead of uh, two brand new board members. But otherwise, there's all three are good candidates. I can answer anything if you do have any questions. So, the fourth candidate, how that was that? Tell me a little bit about that process. How did you solicit? Well, uh, so the school board put notices out on the Herald and also other sources, uh, Metro Valley News and other places. But um, notices went out. It was a 30-day period to submit interests uh, through email or through regular posts. Um, they received several, I believe three, received three. Mm -hmm. um, this morning I noticed an email message that had come in, someone who was expressing an interest in participating. Um, in the email message, uh, Elaine Millington had been CC'd, and so I encouraged the candidate to reach out to Elaine so that they can become familiar with the process. Um, at that point, I didn't feel it was my place to say, well, absolutely apply, because the school board had set a 30-day period for submitting paperwork. So, um, I'm not sure if they've had the opportunity. I know Lane replied to the email, but I don't know if you met with I, the person I spoke with them. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's the fourth person. Um, 
you know, and I don't know how the school board would like to handle that, uh, or if at this point it would even be considered because it's beyond the 30-day wait period or the 30-day notice period. What's your preference with the fourth person? I think I would prefer just to pick one of the three that's already that we're aware of. Just Maybe that's the golden one. What's that? Maybe that's the golden that one. The golden Maybe one, they have the all kinds of experience. Are, seem to be fine. <laughs> I, I, they're professionals. They have <coughs> seen their resumes. I assume they look like they'd be fine. I don't. I don't know that what makes a better candidate. <laughs> just kidding. <Yeah. laughs> There's also an election, There's an election in March. Yeah. There'll, there'll be an election in March. Yeah. So these are appointees until March, and yeah. then in March we'll, we'll they'll go through the ballot process like everybody else. Okay. okay. So this is just filling out through until March. Yep. Okay. Got a couple you want to throw on the table? Okay, I'd like to vote like Survivor here. <laughs> well, I, 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 I agree with Paul that, that Ann Kaplan is, is an obvious choice given her experience and, and desire to serve. And, uh, that, that seems to be... Uh, I think she'd be well-rounded out with Ashley Lincoln sitting beside her. Was that a motion? <laughs> Just trying to move the agenda. Yeah, yeah I agree. <laughs> um, I, 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 would, I would tend to agree with you on that. Other, other thoughts? Is everybody happy with the resumes, or do you want to ask any of them questions? I see a few of them here. I'm comfortable. A motion? Questions? Yeah, I make a motion for Ann and uh, Ashley Lincoln. <coughs> Serve on the school board. I'm sorry, you said Ann and Ashley? Yep. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Thank you for your consideration. Next up, we have the Maple Street Review. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, just a reminder of the board, this has been a, uh, an agenda item that had previously been discussed. Um, the uh, board had reminded staff that the project has not yet been finalized. There has not been a direction that has been set for Maple Street. Um, the project, although we are currently working with our engineering firm uh, to investigate some of the problems that may exist, to investigate some of the issues that are ongoing, um, there is still no direction set for Maple Street, which is uh, one of the reasons why the board wanted to have this meeting to invite residents from Maple Street and then also from neighboring streets that may have some effect uh, due to this project um, so that they can share some input. We have received uh, email messages from residents on both Highland Avenue and um, uh, Maple Street. Uh, in your packets, you will have email, uh, a compilation of email messages from both uh, from residents on both roads. Uh, Marty, our town engineer, asked me to remind you that in her in her effort to, cut, to compile all those email messages, she excluded all the pleasantries. So. She wanted me to let you know that it wasn't residents being rude by not saying hello. It's just that it's just the nuts and bolts. Uh, and then also, these comments are, are up to date, up to 4 p.m. today. So if any resident sent an email message after 4 p.m. today, uh, we were not able to compile those email messages. I know I didn't receive any after 4 p.m. And Marty left the office at 4, so she may have, but they're not in here. We also would like to, to share with the board that we have a representative from our engineering firm, Du Bois and King. Uh, we have Chuck Goodling at the back. He is here to answer any questions that any board member may have regarding movement of poles or narrowing of roads or any other portion of the project. So the struggle we're in with this one if I understand correctly, is Maple Street needs to be reconstructed. Okay. And Can you speak louder, please? Yep, right on it. The Maple Street is needs to be reconstructed. Right. The right of way that we need to reconstruct it with sidewalks, we don't own. Right. And in some cases, there's utility poles in the way that would prevent us from even 
being able to do it without paying also to move utilities right. from those and taking property from the residents on that street. Right. So our option is to reconstruct it with no sidewalks if we leave it two-way traffic. Mm -hmm. The other option is to look at changing it, which was suggested during one of the meetings with the Maple Street neighbors, of changing it to one way, mm -hmm. whichever direction, which would allow for the road and the sidewalk right. within that right away. And the challenge is that should that road go to one way, a portion of the traffic, not all of the traffic, would find its way down some of the other streets, which mostly would be Highland Avenue. So I'm sure that there's other reasons for the Highland Avenue folks not to want this to happen, but because their kids want to play basketball in the road probably isn't a valid reason, and that's one of the only <coughs> ones that kept coming through in the emails. And we have a pretty hefty rec program and a pretty hefty highway budget that just rebuilt that road, so i got to say that's probably not a good excuse to not do it. But somewhere there needs to be a compromise because it's an area, Maple Street is an area where a lot of people walk, and right now where they're walking is in the road. Uh, and a portion of the sidewalk on Maple Street is horrible. And if I understand the history from the historian on the street, it was put in when he was a child, so we can imagine how old that sidewalk is. <laughs> that is payback for your comment about my age when I got here. <laughs> Have we brought both of the neighborhoods together to look at what's there? and what the challenges are to see if, and it seems to me there's going to have to be some give and take mm -hmm. between the two if this is going to work. That's right. Um, from my understanding, this is the first time when both neighborhoods, both Maple Street and Highland Avenue, have been uh, brought together for this one particular issue. Uh, Maple Street has been engaged in the process from, from the beginning. Um, our reasoning at this point was to also include send notices to residents on neighboring streets just so that they are aware of what's happening. Um, and this is when we really learned of some of the major issues that at the very least they are seeing from their perspective and wanted to share with the board. Um, but to answer your question directly, no, there has not been an actual meeting where residents have been invited just so that they all are in the same room together. We could have our engineer and town staff at the same meeting and potentially work out a compromise or at the very least get everyone to understand what the challenges are. And that's something that we, if the board chooses, can do. But, and I, I'd like to see what that means. Like if we go one way going away from Gifford versus one way coming towards Gifford, what's the difference in the traffic flow? Mm -hmm. You know, where does the traffic that goes the opposite direction, where does that traffic go? And they've got models that they can run yep. that kind of show how that will disperse. We are currently working with our regional planning commission. They have been delayed in being able to perform certain traffic Just assessments. Stop right there. Right. <laughs> we, are, we are expecting to have one done very soon. Um, and we will have more data to review for traffic on Maple, to identify how much of that traffic is commercial, how much of it is just local traffic. Um, that process itself should take roughly about two weeks, and we are hoping to have it done relatively soon. Um, don't want to put a timeline on it in case there is some delay on, on the part of our Regional Planning Commission, but the goal is to have that, that study done very soon. It seems like if that's going to happen potentially that soon, that would be nice to schedule a meeting for people who are who have concerns from those two streets before we move forward. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think that you need to study, and I think you need to sit everybody down and figure out what's needed and go from there. You know, I don't know anything about what the right-of-way is. I'd love to know, you know, what's the situation? Why can't we buy more right-of-way? Can we buy more right-of-way? Is that an option? 
Um, you can always so, buy more right away right. for a highway. It's but called eminent domain. And I understand that part. Yes, easy. I got that. I get that. But that <laughs> might create some, some struggles here. So the question is, is, I'm not sure. I don't have enough facts or information to be able to make any decisions on this until after we do the study. Certainly like to see all that. I, I do know that we get down in Beatonville, the business down there, we get a lot of visitors coming in. If they're not familiar with the area, they'll miss the Beatonville Road coming from Exit 3. Most of them come from the south side. And I know a lot of them are traveling up to Maple and turning in because they missed Beanville. So I don't know if there's some options for different signage or visibility onto Beanville to get some of those businesses that may reduce some of the traffic overall down through Maple and Highland, whichever way we go. Um, but I don't know if it's Siri or Google or who it is bringing them that way. But there's certainly directions in you down Maple right now. We've heard it from several folks coming to visit. We have, I, I can't share with the board, is it staff recently started looking into the possibility of reconfiguring the Beanville Road uh, 12 South interchange to make it more easy for larger vehicles, larger commercial vehicles to actually be able to make that turn. Um, I have not seen it's it, but the left hand turn. The left hand turn, right. yeah. Um, yeah, it's almost so possible, right? at some point, if we reconfigure that intersection and we're heading to travel in south, um, depending on what the traffic study says and what the board would like to do, we could add signage that has commercial traffic going straight down uh, 12 and encouraging them to make a more appropriate left-hand turn at the Beanville Road interchange. Um, and that would essentially prevent them from making a left-hand turn on Maple Street or Highland Avenue, just keep them going straight, turn on Beanville Road. There are some challenges there. We have to work with the state. We have to work with the local property owner. So there would involve some um, involvement with the local property owner if they're willing to do that. Um, but that is something that we're considering as an alternative or as an additional step to alleviate potential traffic on Maple or Highland Avenue. As long as we have an engineer here uh, from Voice and King, can he give us an idea of if we do the sidewalk and a two-way street, what it's going to do as far as infringing on other on property owners? I think that's the one big thing. Mm -hmm. If it's going to come over two or three feet in, into my lawn, I'm not going to like that very well. It's going to be right into my garden and everything, and and you get the same problem all the way down through. So I just would like to know how much uh, it would be infringing, uh, because I don't think you're never going to go through the cost of uh, moving those poles, that's for sure. That would be prohibitive. So but. the biggest challenge right now is in portions of Maple Street, we only own 25 feet. And the road itself is 20 feet. So if, were to, if, it's a, to, if it were to be a two-way road, I think it would be 24 feet. You're going to have the, the road plus then you've got the sidewalk, which I believe we, they were talking one side, not both. Right. But in that right-of-way, of 25 feet in some sections we lose seven feet of it to the utility poles so we really only have 18 feet unless we do utility relocation so it's a lot it's not just a simple couple feet it's probably I the question I just, no, I'm sorry. hang on just a second I just need you to, I just need you to state your name Jack Cowdery Hang on, hang on, guy. Yeah. Were you all set, Jack? You went to okay. 18 Highland Avenue, uh, Randolph, and and uh, we've been there for 51 years now, and the road's been rebuilt a couple times. The last time through, we lost two or three feet. I don't know exactly how much, but of our front lawn, and including there were some markers. Down in the ground, the, uh, the the pipe deal, the property line markers, they went too. So they came right on to our property in good shape and put in a nice sidewalk. And I don't really know, there's no been no impact study on traffic study at this time, which seems a little odd to me that we would do anything without a study. And the impact on Highland is going to be significant. And I wonder if the board's aware of uh, increased traffic usually drops property values. So I would expect to value all the property on Highland to go down slightly. 
if all of a sudden you double or triple the traffic. Because I see no reason why it wouldn't. And there's a lot of information on the internet studies from different groups, and they all agree high traffic decreases value of properties. So that's one thing I don't go for. And the other problem is, why not fix the existing sidewalk? In Main Street, Randolph has four or <coughs> five poles between the sidewalk and the road. They're basically in the road. Why wouldn't that be an option for going down Maple? Same as you got on Main Street. There's five or six of them that are actually in the road. So I don't see a problem with the, put the sidewalk on the other side of it. That's an issue. So I think it would impact Highland in a negative manner as well as South Street to make that one way. I, I would prefer to go, you know, the existing sidewalk repaired and keep it two ways. Thank you. So right now what we need to do is pull the engineer in to look at the options, get the traffic study, mm -hmm. and then take that data. My good opinion, meet with both or anybody up there that wants to sit down, have a, whether it's a public meeting or just the engineer in the town sure. staff to do it and see these are what all the options are and these are the impacts. Okay. So I'll, uh, what I will do is follow up with our regional planning commission and ensure that they give me at the very least a time frame for when the study will be completed, schedule a, a, a meeting that includes all local residents, give them enough time to attend, give them enough warning of the time, and then speak to them about it, and then bring the results of that meeting to the select board for a future meeting. Sure. Okay. Yeah, we're not, uh, so we're going to hold off on anything about what it will do to us and whatnot. If you have a question about the process that we're talking about, we'll take that. My, my question is, Du Bois and King was hired, but have they done any planning as to what they perceive should happen? I mean, aside from the one way, have they looked at the street and have they come up with what they think should happen? Do you have a design? I think that's the question. Kind of a we yeah. have designs available. We do have uh, different scenarios depending on the movement of the utility poles, whether we take property through a minute domain, whether we don't. Um, so there, there are different scenarios that we've discussed. There <coughs> are designs that have been printed, but again, nothing has been finalized because the select board needs to hear from the community, understand what the challenges are, the traffic study, before we make it final, before the select board makes a final decision. So, yes, there are designs and there are issues with uh, any number of them. And uh, the chair has mentioned some of the constraints of why a one way is being proposed. But yes, there are designs. Right, and I get that. But I mean, if we don't know what the designs are that are proposed, maybe it's something we're happy with. Well, we're asking them to take and figure out these other designs, then get the traffic impacts from those designs to go with it and then come out and meet with you folks so you see what all the options are. And if we go with option A, this is where the traffic will move to. If we go with option B, this is, or if we just keep it the same and we have it two lanes, traffic's gonna stay where it is, but this means we gotta take X number of feet of land down through here. We gotta move these utility poles and the steps that means. Okay, so is the in the taking of land, mm -hmm. is it an option to take an equal amount from each side in order to do a proposal? Does it all have to be one-sided or can it be equally split? So if you need four feet, can you take it two feet from each side? In some of these places, we're talking more like 10 and 12 feet. So it's not just a couple feet. So yes, you well, can I look at that, both sides. Just, you can, right. but you need everybody to cooperate to take it from both sides, right? So I can't have the first half of the road equally going, and then the next one says, no, I'm not doing it. The road can't jot over and no, I, back, I, I, so we would I need everybody that. to. I get that, but whatever design mm -hmm. is approved by the residents, would it be equal? It could be equal. It could be all one side. It could go either way, and we can show it both ways, what it would mean. And some of them, I think it takes it right up almost to the porch 
of them to get the, road the study area. Would help a lot. Yeah. yeah, I think the study. We have a lot of traffic. Traffic problems. study, I think, is important. Tractor trailers start at six o'clock in the morning, go till nine o'clock at night. Yep. Excuse me, ma'am. Can you state your name, please? I'm sorry, Sharon Lewis. Okay. Any more questions on the process? So. Uh, Oops, hang on. Um, it was you state your name so you can get it. Yes, of course. James Owens, 35 Maple Street. Um, it was my understanding from Marty's email announcing this meeting to us that, that decisions were going to be made this evening. Um, is it now safe to assume that that's not the case? That's not the case at this so, point. Okay. Yep. And so there will, once the results of the traffic study are available, um, then we will have the opportunity to meet with the town along with people who live on Highland and, and the other neighboring streets and then can work with some actual facts about where, or at least some good projections on where traffic is going to go and what the actual consequences are of the various design decisions so that people can say, okay, 10 or 12 feet of property that needs to be taken or X number of dollars that needs to be spent on utility pole re relocation versus one way or two way. Yep. We'll have all of those facts available. Yes. And, and we'll have some input in a, in a meeting format, maybe not just emails before, and that will be part of the, of the data that you use to make the decision. Am I understanding that I would hope that, that, that type of meeting would take place before it comes to us to make the decision. I'm sorry, say again, please. I would hope that meeting where all the stuff's there and everybody gets to comment and talk about it would happen before it will come back to okay. us. Okay, for the record, that would also be my hope, yeah. <laughs> that, that you would have that information available. We'd like a consensus from the neighborhood so we'd know what direction to go here. Y yeah, that's so, how we're going to get there, is by having yeah. all the information right. and then maybe three or two or three four yeah. options. And I think, I, I mean, the gentleman who, who lives on Highland I, I fully appreciate his concerns. I share many of those concerns, but from the Maple Street side. Mm -hmm. And I think we, he and I and, uh, as long, and Bill and, and others, um, I think can, can come to a much better appreciation of what the stakes are once the data is more generally available. And some plans, maybe. Oh yeah, and that as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. You can't leave the engineers. Yeah. You gotta have them. Just state your name, so Shannon, uh, Barbara Waldo. And I guess my question is, why are we considering changing the street to one way instead of just fixing? It's been two way forever. Why are we involving other streets? We don't why own don't enough just, right away. What? We don't own enough right away to change it to to reconstruct it even the way it is right now mm -hmm. and meet today's standards. We don't own enough right away. Well, I've done some research on the internet about one-way streets, and they don't sound that attractive to me because it says, for one thing, it makes it a through street and not a getting someplace street, but getting right through it. So the traffic's going to be going faster. They're not going to be paying that much attention because they're, they're going through. They're not going to it. And we have nothing on our street that needs deliveries from trucks. Nothing. We are, we're in a res residential section. We don't have the hospital on our street. We don't have anything that does, you know needs delivery. So to have trucks come down our street, I don't know why. Why would they? Fuel trucks. They don't have business there. Well, we're talking about other no, commercial trucks. No, we're talking about commercial <coughs> deliveries, well, we'll not get the, the fuel data. trucks, and not the mail truck, and not the regular trucks. We're talking about all this extra huge okay. trucks going through, 18-wheelers, all this. From morning to night. Yeah. So that's my question: Is yeah. why we're even why we're considering throwing it over onto Highland when Highland just got fixed and has a new sidewalk, has a beautiful road, it's done. Why upset that road to do the other road? I mean, so we'll get the data, mm -hmm. we'll get the traffic study, we'll get the options, we'll get another meeting set. Right. For you guys, and the engineer and the town staff, and then we'll do it. Talking about what one way streets do to areas and how much it's changed that their people are not going there. Okay. Any more questions about the process? Anybody else? No. Good. All good? Good? Okay.
mixed up water and wastewater. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, that emptied the room. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think that was going to happen. <laughs> um, that's fine. Well, that's a good looking group, so I'm pretty sure we can get them all together for the next meeting, huh? <laughs> group photo. <laughs> Do we have anybody here on the water and wastewater? Yeah, good. An abatement by, this is an abatement from Gifford and Wind River allocation. We have uh, a pot pool from Gifford here. We also have our water, super, water and wastewater superintendent here. We're that one. Um, <laughs> but I would like to point out, uh, if I made to the board, that there has been, well, in our most recent research with the most uh, recent legislative uh, calendar for the state, we have found that the state altered its, in some ways, altered its uh, rules for abatement of uh, taxes. It used to just be, be included a, an item in your packets here, um, which is this item. This is a, an update to the legislative session of this year. Um, the change that happened was that the Board of Abatements previously mostly only allowed to consider or the practice was to consider abatement of taxes. In this most recent legislative session, we learned that the state law itself, um, 24 VSA, Chapter 51, Subsection 1533, was altered to include um, property taxes and water and sewer charges. So. Um, what used to be the practice in town of having the Water Wastewater Committee review the request, <laughs> then send it to the select board for consideration, was changed by the state. So now these types of requests must be, uh, well, at the very least, according to this language, uh, reviewed by also the Board of Abatement, which includes the Board of Civil Authority, the Listers, uh, the Justice of the Peace, the Town Clerk, and Town Treasurer. So we can't act on this. Uh, no. No. Okay. And it, 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 I, I, Doug, I understand that you're here for this. It was something that recently. Yeah, that's, that's news to me. Yeah. This is all news to me. Yeah. We just received the revised bill. Um, must have been last Thursday from the town. Yeah. For the value that we discussed with the water, wastewater, sewer committee, and this is this is total news to me. So. Yeah. This is new. Uh, because we just learned of it in our research, you know, the process. So. But uh, hmm. just as a reminder, the Board of Civil Authority, uh, I'm sorry, the Board of Abatement also includes the Board of Civil Authority, which is made up of the Board of Selectmen. So. That's Board of Selectmen, the 12 Justices of Peace, and the town clerk is the Board of Civil Authority. The Board of Abatement yeah. is the select board, the Board of Listers, the 12 Justices of Peace, and the Treasurer. <laughs> mm. And you have to have a quorum of the board in order to transact business. So it has to be a minimum of 11 people in order to do business. And they have to meet the criteria as laid out in 1535, 24, 1535. That is going to be a tough hurdle. Darn that state of Vermont. Yeah. Hey, I only found out about that at a conference I went to. I was like, oh, oh. I didn't hear about this. Why mm. didn't I hear about this? Mm. So what's the true definition of that abatement? So we, the, we requested originally to abate the overall eight-year bill. We discussed terms with the committee, the Wastewater Water Committee, um, to alter that um, to a three-year and um, decrease it through a percentage based on how much Gifford does do for the community. And we looked at the issue at hand and said this, that this isn't the sole responsibility of the Gifford um, team. And since it's not a true net zero abatement and it's a value, is that still the process that this needs to go through? At this point, there's a set of criteria that the Board of Abatement has to follow with any requests uh, for abatement. Um, so it's basically a reduction in the original request, right? So that doesn't. What's that doesn't the amount that we're drop that the request is to drop the invoice by how much? 
Well, depending on the, the if we take, the, well, there have been many price changes or rate changes from when this issue first began or when we have pinpointed the general time frame of when it began to now. So the range of total cost for water service and, and wastewater ranges anywhere from roughly $69,000 to $89,000. Um, so we would have to figure out exactly what fees commenced when and try to alter the total cost of the amount of. So can, if not to go the try to circumvent the Board of Abatement, but I'm going to. Um, can the Board of, because the Select Board is also the Water Sewer Board, correct? So if we put that hat on, can we accept in a, um, they listed quite a hefty amount of stuff they'd done, including installing sidewalks and whatnot. Can we accept that as payment towards that invoice? Because that's not abatement, because we're not writing it off. We're right. agreeing to accept a certain value for the work that they've completed to be credited towards their water wastewater. I'm not opposed to doing it only because the water wastewater committee has already agreed to drop mm -hmm. the invoice to twelve thousand. Yeah. And if we look at the list of the efforts they've done, yeah, it's a fair amount of money. I would have to check with the town's attorney to see if we could accept payment in compensation other than finances. Uh, it could be in work performed. Um, I don't know if there would be precedence for that. If there isn't, I'm pretty sure that we would be able to do it. But I would have to... I suppose at this point, if the board were inclined to, to take that position, um, we could certainly decide to make a motion and pass it, and then I could then, you know, it could be dependent on the advice of council. Um, I'd just like to say I was on that, in that discussion in the sewer wastewater committee about this, and it was, it was a very difficult process that we went through, because there's no policy that pertains to this eventuality. Um, and so we were really trying to make it up on the fly as we went along, and um, well, I left that meeting feeling like we did not do a very good job of that. And I think that this deserves further consideration by like, the people who are really looking into all the pros and cons and looking at what the law is and all this stuff. I, I'd rather see us really take a fresh look at it. So knowing the way the abatement process works, they're not going to make it. So that decision is one that says they ought to pay the full bill and have no consideration for what took place because they won't make the criteria for an abatement. There is, a, yeah, if I may share more with the board, the language in the recently updated uh, subsection does specifically speak to um, abatements of amounts that have been built. Um, and in this case, there is a question of whether the outstanding amount of between 69 to 89,000 has been billed or we just specifically have billed for the 12,000 that had been discussed during, during the Water Waste Water Committee. So, so we've only issued an invoice for the 12,000? I believe. Christian? I think we actually issued an invoice. We issued a rough number. I have to check with my department on that. I think it's a proposal. You guys recalculated it based on the values for the last yeah. 12 quarters. Yeah. And it came out to 11,000 and change. So I, I do want to say in the process that they use, we are giving people a pretty good method to steal water from us. That was one of the things that I, it was an afterthought after the meeting, and it was like, we're setting ourselves up for a problem. It was one of the things that I came up with out of that. I'm not saying that we can't do something to you know, after the fact type deal to avoid future issues with it, but just uh, one of the realizations was to only go back three years and take 50% as the bill would set us up to steal water because all you'd have to do is go put in your own meter and if we go three, four years and we don't catch it until that point, 
now you've just you've paid for that meter and you've got away with a bunch. But that's one thing that I kind of left there. That was not our intention. I hope we prove that to the committee, but that's not no, something no, we really really that's your intention. No, that, 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 that's not, yeah, I'm talking about in general. We're giving people an option. Which are you saying? I, I was in the impression earlier that you were that that we were saying it wouldn't make it through the abatement that we that was because of the quorum. But you're saying that it actually doesn't meet doesn't meet any, any of the criteria. Any of the criteria. Any of the criteria. Any of the so what they would have to be is they had to die, insolvent. They have to have moved from the state. So we're not going to get either of those. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a person unable to pay their taxes or charges. <clears throat> they don't meet that one. An error by the listers, which it's not. And on real property, real or personal property lost or destroyed during the tax year. And persons otherwise eligible for exemption due to sickness, disability, or good co other good cause as determined by the Board of Abatement. Mm -hmm. Or a mobile home that's been moved to another town. Right, right, right. I don't see one of yeah, them they yeah, can no, get I in see, on I it. Totally get what you're saying. So yeah. either we define that we haven't invoiced it yet, mm -hmm. so it's not anything that we can abate anyway. So the invoice is the twelve thousand or I think you look into that. You know, you're in a tough spot because if you say go to the board of abatement, you're saying you're gonna you got to pay the full amount because the Board of Abatement is not going to be able to do anything. Mm -hmm. I think it lands in our lap, that extra that extra 250 bucks a year you get <laughs> to make decisions like this. <laughs> exactly. 125 is just the water. Is that so what it is? water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you get 125 bucks a year to really? be the water commissioner. God, I'm doing I'm really breaking it in here. <laughs> Early retirement. Almost. <laughs> put that in my social security check here. All right. Well. It's a tough one. Mm -hmm. Huh. But you didn't invoice it yet, so. Mm. Sorry, what's your name, Doug? Doug Fulton. Doug Fulton. Thank you. Hmm. Is there a loophole? <coughs> Which I know was had been issued yet. I proposed the bill on behalf of the Water Committee has been sent, but that's not an invoice. Not an invoice. So, mm -hmm. and then there's the question of, there is a question of, even if we expected give it to pay the full amount, what is that, the, what is that full amount is not clear, because the water rates and the sewer rates change during the period of time. Coming out of that committee, they, <clears throat> What's that? Was, when you came out of that committee meeting, mm -hmm. was it consensus that 12000 was the amount? It, it was consensus. Whether you feel good about it or not, yeah, was no, 12,000 the consensus? It, 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 it was consensus, um, but yeah, I didn't, I, after, after we left the meeting, I really had a lot of second thoughts about it. It, it, was, it, was a, it was one of the hardest meetings I've ever been in, um, trying to figure out what the right thing to do is, because we, we had so little guidance um, from, from any kind of policy. We'll send you guys a bill for 89,000, you send us a bill for 83, and we'll call it close enough. Uh, no, 12,000 difference. <laughs> I just was, well, yeah, but they're going to come out ahead. So <laughs> right? We're going to pay for the sidewalks. 69,000, 89,000. What's wrong that solution? So I'm just throwing it out there. So the, the, thinking, the thinking of the, thinking of, <laughs> of, of the committee at the time, we were thinking, well, if, if we were going to make policy, because now it seems like we really do have to create a policy that covers something like this so that we don't have to go through this again. We thought, okay, well, if we were making policy, what would we do? Like, how would we make, what, what would be the policy? And so we t took it upon ourselves to kind of do that thought experiment, but in a, in a very condensed period of time. And I don't think we really did it justice. Um, but, what we, but the thinking that we did come up with was, well, if someone came to us with a bill, you know, would we expect somebody to pay a bill that went back? How far back do you go? before you're like, no, that's just too old. You know, someone has a bill from 1902, like we would never expect them to pay that today, There's right? There's statute of limitations here somewhere. If someone has a bill from two years ago, yeah, sure, you pay that, but wait, you know, somewhere in between there, there's, there's a line that you draw that's kind of arbitrary. 
And in our thinking, in that one moment, we, th we said, well, three years seems like a reasonable period of time to go back. And then if you go back three years, what portion of the bill do you expect to get back? Do you get back the whole thing? Do you get back more? And again, in that moment, during the, during, you know, considering the, you know, the sort of the dynamics of that particular conversation, we decided about you know, that half of it would be reasonable. And then we asked, and then we decided that it would make sense for there to be other mitigating circumstances, which we gave Gifford credit for some of the improvements which they've done in, over the years. And we decided that we would, you know, um, divide it in half again for that. Um, again, it, at the end of that process, I didn't feel like we had really given it its, its, its due, that we didn't consider it as, as closely or as, as thoroughly as we really ought to have. Um, sort of felt pressure to, to kind of get it done. People need to leave the meeting, and we felt like we needed to make a decision. If I were to do it over again, I would have um, said that, no, even though people need to leave, we really should be uh, not rushing this decision, and there's not, I, I don't think there was any reason why we actually had to make the decision on that particular day. We could have made it, we could have set another meeting and continued the conversation. I think that would have been a much better course of action. Have you heard from any of the other committee members? No, I haven't discussed it? it with them since then. So they may be happy with the decision? They may be. Joy, since you learned about this change in the rule, have, have you been given I any? A, I was at a, a clerks and treasurer conference. But since you learned that, have you been given any insight as to why they put this under because, the Board of Abatement? Because we can sell a property for delinquent water sewer charges at tax sales. So the legislature changed the law that if you're going to be able to sell a property for delinquent water sewer charges, then it should follow the same mm -hmm. policy and procedure that is set up for property taxes. So they changed it so that the language becomes inclusive for property taxes and water sewer charges. And has a conflict of, in, or not a conflict of interest, but has a conflict been uh, identified between us being the sewer and water commissioners versus them being the board of abatement? Um, because I see a lot of Vermont rules that are changing lately that don't give consideration to all the impacts. I don't think the legislature looked at that. Um, not all towns, the water sewer commissioners are the same people. Most, a lot of towns it is, but there are some other places where they are not the same people. So I, I, I don't believe that they took that into account. Like I said, I only found out after the fact and it was like, oh. <laughs> um, so um, it's all new to me as, as to how it applies to water sewer charges. Um, but if you're using the same criteria that you use for taxes, it, it's very narrow. Um, you, you know, the, the, the language is very specific there, and um, the board has very little leeway in making a decision. And even when they make a decision, they, they are never required to make, to approve an abatement. Somebody may meet the criteria, but they, the board has the discretion to not abate. Um, you know, just because they meet the criteria doesn't mean that <coughs> the, the abatement will go forward. Um, the, the, the board has the discretion to approve it or disapprove it. So does the rest of this rule have a process for exemptions or appeals? Because one of the things with moving the water and sewer to it, would I would want to appeal based on failure of equipment. Why isn't that in there? And that's not for you to answer, I'm just throwing it out there. Well, that he it, could appeal based on the water meter didn't work at Red Wrong. Well, we haven't read it in eight years, we don't know. Um, with abatement, I, I don't know that it follows the same process as it does with tax assessment appeals. With tax assessment appeals, pe you know, taxpayers have the right to appeal to superior court or to the state appraiser to, uh, you know, uh, appeal the, the decision of the Board of Civil Authority. In the case of a Board of Abatement, I'm not sure if it follows the same rules. Um, that's something that you'd have to find out about. Um, if it did, I mean, I, I, I would suspect it would probably be that they would have to go through Superior Court because the state appraiser has nothing to do with water sewer charges. Registered on the meter. You know, and, and to appeal to, to Superior Court, it's like a $295 
fee to file an appeal? I believe there is an exemption for a misread. So if there is a misread of the meter itself, um, I don't believe that would necessarily fall under this requirement. Um, and that comes to mind because I did have a conversation with staff regarding whether uh, a non-read for whatever reason, whether you know there's miscommunication between whether it was a primary meter or not meter, constitutes a misread. From my interpretation, a non-read doesn't constitute a misread, but staff felt that it could be a misread. So there are exemptions for misreads of, of meters, and that falls under a different process um, than the Board of Abatement. But the challenge but here they're is they're not asking for an abatement, right? No. The question before us isn't an abatement. It's whether they should be billed for the usage registered on the meter, mm -hmm. and if so, how much and on what schedule. Right. So we're really not abatement doesn't come into this unless we decide. What they're asking us to decide is how much should they pay. Yeah. And what we're being told is that the water wastewater committee met on that and set 12,000 rushed not feeling good about it afterwards I get but there the balls in our court That's right. to say this is how much they should be billed for this incident mm -hmm. and then if they don't like it then Gifford can abate it at which point then it goes to the board of abatement which you know, you heard the criteria yeah it's that, that wasn't my impression when we were not at rosy. My impression was that the that the that the water sewer committee was doing an abatement, that we weren't figuring out what the what the bill ought to be. Um, they don't have the authority to do an abatement. They can't do an abatement. Can just to make a recommendation for yeah for an amount to the select board how much to charge. How much to charge. I, I, I think the way I'm the way I'm I'm, I'm understanding and <clears throat> is. Trini, you're correct in that at this point, the discussion of the abatement is a step beyond where we are now. And that because we have not issued an invoice, because the town has yet to <coughs> tell Gifford, this is how much you have to pay for us or pay us for the usage, there is no invoice, there is no abatement request. Um, so Trini's correct. The question that is before the select board now is the amount that is to be billed. Um, and whether that falls anywhere from the total amount to the amount that was recommended by the Water Wastewater Committee, which is 11,600. Um, so what we know about this, if you look at the facts, is that the average household spends about $3,000 a year on their water wastewater. Mm -hmm. And we've got about eight years of this packed up. But the usage on the meter is totaling between sixty-nine and eighty-five thousand. Not sure how we didn't get closer than that, but it's because the wastewater rates change during the time interval in question, and we don't know what the what, what the usage was during those periods. Right? Yeah, you don't. We don't know what the what the flows were during. When those it periods. We have no idea what the usage was during the periods. Yeah. We just know the total usage. But we know that if it was a home, and if we said this was a residence for eight years, three thousand dollars is twenty-four grand. I'm not sure why it's relevant if it was a home. It's just the comparables that she's got. How do you know it's three thousand dollars when the rate changes over those years too? It would be a range of two thousand to six thousand dollars, or because um, of the rate water, I guess waste water change. I'm struggling with if the average home paid three thousand dollars a year. How did you get to twelve thousand? If you said for eight years you had use as a hospital, we believe it came between seventy and ninety thousand. The average house, if you said the residence next door, paid three thousand a year for those eight years, I would think the minimum that we would invoice them would be the twenty four thousand, which would be the residential usage because we know they were above that but oh well we know we know that they use at least 70 69 something amount of, of water and wastewater we know that that's the floor 
because if, if because we know how much they used all together based upon that meter reading, and we know that at the beginning of that period what the rates were. So if we use just the beginning, the rates that were set at the beginning of the period. That brings it to the 69. That, yes, exactly. That's a good opinion. Good reduction. Mm -hmm. Is the committee working on a new section for their rules and what to do next time? So we calculate this we, the next time. We sure time. need to. We need to it would be much it would be much nicer to have a policy for this and not be making it up on the fly. So do we have a kinda to take this the other way so this doesn't happen again, do we have an inventory of all our water meters out there? And I'm gonna assume no, <laughs> because this is the second time in three years that we found a new one for Gifford. Mm -hmm. Right? So I imagine it's happening somewhere else. So do we have a way to check what we're metering and what we're putting out of our reservoirs? Wouldn't that be the easiest thing to all of a sudden find 89,000 gallons nice a year or could, something? But you got a lot of leaks. Uh, well, yeah, well, no, I, leaks. I get that on the uh, leaks, but. Uh, our meter reading system is too primitive. It boils down to. Um, to go around, you'd literally have to read the entire town Every day, probably, you know, we've got to go for probably at least a week so you get some numbers to compare. And then you'd have to do a week of pumping again. You couldn't read the entire town in a day. It's just not possible. And it takes us two days for most of the, for two of the routes to read it. And uh, when we're divided into three routes. It, our meter reading system is just not capable of it. it I'd like it to be. We have the best inventory we can on meters. Um, this meter was purchased in October of 2010 by Gifford. I tracked it back to census. Census showed it when it was bill date, and it was billed to E.J. Prescott, and it was delivered to E.J. Prescott on October 14th of 2010, and then E.J. Prescott billed it to Gifford on October 15th of 2010. So that's the only fact of where that is. Um, the only other fact is is that Joe Vosey was one in charge, and he did know our process, which so I'm, I'm kind of shocked that he didn't do all the paperwork. He should have, you know, the guy that was a former water wastewater superintendent should know <laughs> what the process was. I'm not looking for instantaneous comparisons, but if we right. took numbers over a year, we could get within 5%. Over two years, we should be able to get to 2 or 3%, and, and mm -hmm. the more you take the average numbers, the more we can compare it to be able to say whether over the last two or three years, that we're missing a significant amount of revenue. We have been, um, well, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Uh, Marty did do that in comparison to, I don't know if she gave you guys that chart or not, but there was, she did a comparison, there was three meters there prior. <coughs> and when they added this one in, it was for their surgical wing, correct, to, to, go on, to for sterilization water. Instead of sending it through the softener system then up there, they added that in to go up there. Um, so then now there was four meters. There was a drop of about 180 some odd units between those three meters when this one came out. Um, so, and it kind of falls in line. This meter averages out to be about 202 a quarter based on assuming it was installed as soon as they got it and starting with, I believe, the December 2010 quarter. So. And it was installed in this, the two active meters, right, right on that wall. That, that photo was attached to Did that. they go read the other two meters? Yes. And this one's right beside it, and they right. didn't read this one? There, there, there is one, one item that I did point out during the Water Wastewater Committee is the potential crossing of, of language or word usage. In that, in, in that same meeting, we had a Gifford representative who said this was a primary secondary meter. And I said, listen, that, that could have been the cause of a problem or that could be a cause of this problem continuing in that we continue to use the word secondary when describing a meter because in our wastewater water committee or in the wastewater water world, that could mean secondary, I don't have to read it. Um, but then the argument is, well, I said primary and secondary. And so that's still continuing now, and it's something I pointed out during the meeting. I said, let's drop the secondary altogether. If this is a meter we have to read. So it could have been a continuation of that problem from then to now, and that went 
when town water reader, meter readers were to show up, someone said this is a primary secondary meter. Our staff heard primary sec heard secondary and left it alone. But we don't know. How many water mains are going into Gifford? Two. 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 Sounds to me like there's enough to go around mm -hmm. on this one. If we've got a committee that rushed or not rushed, but you know, came up to 12,000 and we've got a hefty amount of improvements that Gifford's made that really sidewalk <coughs> responsibility. So I actually had a question on that. The, the two and a half or three and a half pages of um, contribution slash outreach, I guess Doug or Ashley, I'm not sure who can answer this, but you know, hours volunteered are awesome, don't get me wrong, but to me, everybody yeah, has business in the community should be volunteering hours to the community, right? So put a price on those or not, I don't, I don't know. But what I'm having trouble understanding is like, um, on, is, there, is there a difference between contributions and outreach? And the reason I ask is contributions, you guys can go out and do these prevention conference leads support. Are you, is that a reimbursement from the federal government or some grants that you guys are getting to do those, right, one? And if they are, then that's a net zero to me, right? Because it's good that people are doing time, but you guys are getting reimbursed for it, so it's not really a contribution. Um, the sidewalks and that stuff, that you know, all makes sense to me. And again, the outreach, you know, the tent time for the farmer's market and the concert series are all awesome things, which I think should count. But I'm having a hard time to really put a true value to this and separating labor from materials and what is reimbursed to the hospital as grant money versus you know, out of out of the goodness of Gifford's, you know, community <clears throat> outreach. So I don't know where that line is. Yeah, and you know, and the other issues here are also that, you know, all, all these things are things that Gifford did, you know, what they, they would have done anyway. And if they had been billed properly during this time, they would have paid those bills without question. Um, and we're asking now just the wastewater district to absorb, you know, the, these costs and the benefits that are, that are spoken of here are benefits to the entire town or perhaps even the whole region. And we're asking the wastewater district themselves well, and to, some of to, those, to foot that whole cost. Yeah, you know, some of those you're right, but like the sidewalks and paving Maple Street and doing the survey of where the utilities are located, those are town responsibilities. Sure. So, right. so those I think are hard numbers yeah. that we can yeah. work with. Mm -hmm. I, I agree that all the other stuff is. Right. We're, still asking, we're the still asking just a portion of the town to then absorb that cost, not the whole town. Oh, well, because you're saying it's coming out of the water, wastewater water budget exactly. only. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I get you. So what was the recommendation, 12,000? Yeah. Uh, 11,000, 11, almost 12,000. Okay. Yeah. So whatever that number is, I'm going to make the motion that we uh, use that number and that's what we will bill them for. seconds on that I don't personally I don't have a good a good feeling what that number should be I mean I don't know I don't know if I have enough information to be able to you know. well I'm gonna put my trust in the water sewer commission did this 69 and came back with 89,000 down to 11,900 yeah. seems like and a huge mm -hmm. delta to me yeah. and I don't understand why <laughs> because it was halves and halves and halves if, mm -hmm. if I could add mm -hmm. another uh, maybe Potential advice to the, the select board is there is also the option if the board does not like the recommendation of the water wastewater committee if there are some feelings about the process, it, it can send this back to the water wastewater committee and have them take a look at it again, come back with some more hard numbers, have uh, you know more detailed focused conversation that I could ask our highway department to put hard facts numbers on sidewalks streets. Uh, that type of information, and then have another recommendation brought to the select board again. There's there's no reason why the select board would have to accept that recommendation now. I would just send it back and say, do it again with these specific questions that need to be answered. Yeah, because I mean, sixty nine thousand dollars, and you mean just subtracting the sidewalk off eighty three thousand. That could be bringing it to zero right there if we consider that as a reduction. That's what I said earlier. I, I know, but like there's I, no there's, like, there's no there's no gonna, math behind it. Okay, Eric. well. You know, my, there's no math. But I understand this, there's so. no math, and I understand that somebody's got to carry the load. But I think, like Trini said, there's enough blame to go around here. So my suggestion is, is just take the 12 grand that was the or the whatever it was, and just move it forward. And you know, we can wipe this off our plate and be done with it. Yeah, I'm not. It says that the water wastewater committee decided 
um, in these situations to only consider charges for the past three years and only bill 50% of that amount. In this case, they also recommended reducing the amount by an additional 25% for their overall contributions to the community. Bottom line, recommending billing of 11,687.13. So if they've decided to go back three years, bill 50% of that amount, and then take a reduction from what type of guidance do we want to give them? What do we not sounds like? Sounds like a dark board to me. I'm sorry. I just Throw the darts again? Yeah, I mean, again. <laughs> yeah. But, I don't know. You were there, so if yeah, you... Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would be comfortable having the committee review it again. Okay. It's not a rush, right? No, they're not going anywhere. And how would Gifford a feel if we get away from the know. twelve thousand? Yeah, That's but it's a substantial chunk of money. You would for feel the comfortable with that amount? System and that. it seems like it'd be worth giving it a, a good due process, since we are not really in a what was your time urgent. I asked him if Gifford would feel comfortable being invoiced for the approximately twelve thousand. It's clear in their comments in here that they feel. The town's got some skin in it. Yeah. I think we do. How do you go there and read two meters and not read the third one? Okay. That's whether we were misled or I'm mis sorry, Chris, I didn't have the history on it. You're saying Joe was a part of Gifford when that was installed and yes. didn't report it? Okay. Well, he was? Yes, Joe Losey had left he left the town of Randolph, water wastewater superintendent, went to Gifford, he was in Patrick's um, position who is the facilities manager. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, and I also, I, I, if I did give this impression, I, I would like to apologize, but I, I didn't mean to give the impression that uh, Gifford had done anything to attempt to mislead the town. No, no, no. Um, I just wanted to make sure that, that I stress that it, it could have been a language usage that at Gifford maintenance and meant primary, secondary, you should read it, and in Randolph, water, wastewater meant you didn't have to read it. So if I did give the impression that Gifford was trying to mislead the town of the wastewater water uh, department, I, I apologize, that's not my intention. I didn't get that impression. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm fine, that's not the case. So what do we want to do? Well, I don't think there's an easy way to calculate it any, any way you should look at it, whether you go over an average. And the only way you can accurately throw a number at it is to bill the entire amount, and I'm not sure that's fair either. So if Barry was to make his motion again, I would probably second it. Well, I'll make it so the no motion is moved. I just think that over the years we've done a really poor job with things like this, and we need to figure out a way to reduce the possibility of it happening again. Mm -hmm. This, is the, second, see the this is the second time with them yeah. for oh. a significant amount of money again, which was our fault again. I don't agree that it was our fault again, though. If, yeah. if their employee didn't do the proper paperwork for the staff, then maybe some are right fault, but not certainly not all. Is your motion still live? My motion's alive. A second. A motion and a second to invoice for the eleven thousand and change or twelve thousand. What was the motion for? The eleven and whatever's on the sheet. Eleven thousand eighty-seven thirteen. Yeah. Your seconds for that amount. Yes. A motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Abstained. Motion carries three two. Next up, we have Wind River Wastewater Allocation Request. Um, this is a request that has come in to the town that was also considered by the Water Wastewater Committee and is spurring from a previous decision that the Select Board had made to make it more, make the town more business friendly to alleviate some of the water, wastewater connection fees. Um, uh, once the select board had taken action to 
uh, alter some of the impact fee language that previously existed. We were approached by Wind River Environmental in an effort to try to uh, purchase additional allocation in wastewater, because uh, that's the industry that they are in. Um, and so the Water Wastewater Committee reviewed the request and um, uh, made several recommendations. Uh, I'm not sure if Larry, you'd like to speak a little bit more about feeling of the um, This was much easier. <laughs> um, it, it was, it was, it was, this felt like a, a much more, a very straightforward request. Um, it, given the nature of their business, it seemed like it, just really made sense to work with them to come up with this, um, to come up with uh, this, this agreement that we did. So I, I, there was there was really no no contention about it. Everybody was very comfortable with it, and uh, I feel strongly that we should take the the, uh, the advice of the wastewater sewer committee in this instance. And some of the just to clarify, the, the specific request would be to grant an additional wastewater allocation up to 13,999 gallons per day. And that amount is by design. Um, company and our water department has learned that anything above that amount would trigger a federal requirement. So the maximum that they're interested in is in the 13,999. But we do have current language in our um, ordinances that if there is a specific amount of time that is given to a company to pay off their total allocation fee. If they don't meet that time frame, then the company loses the total amount that they have paid toward that amount. So Wind River is hoping that one of the well, one of the requests is to grant them a variance to the existing language that says if they paid 99% um, of what they were supposed to pay within a five-year period, but can't pay the the rest of it, the, the remaining 0.01% until five years in a day, that they don't lose the 99% of the amount of money that they've already paid toward it. They'd like to have that amount just contribute towards the allocation that they've requested. And get the allocation on a prorated basis. Exactly. Could we meter their outflow? Oh, that's a Is good that question. how we would know? No. <laughs> We only, well, actually, per day, right? Can we meet their bill? I knew we were going to ask you that question. We do. We meet with them. They actually have a special wastewater meter that we go over and we check it quarterly to make sure that our reads and their reads match up. They actually report to us daily. Or, well, I guess they send a report weekly. But weekly. They measure daily. So, yes, we are fully aware of how much they discharge to us. I was just thinking of a billing nightmare it would be if we didn't somehow have a way to measure that. <laughs> they, they took care of that. Yeah. I think my confusion, Chris, if I remember correctly, it is the residents that we don't measure the wastewater. Correct. We it's take the wastewater off of the water. Because here. in Wind River's case, obviously, they bring in a bunch of wastewater yeah. and don't use, they actually don't use all that much water. This would generate a considerable amount of additional revenue for the district if the board were to take the recommendations of the water waste park. Any questions? Yes. Motion? Make motion. Set the wind water. A second. A motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Motion kicked. I'm just going to keep coming up with new names for companies so that I when, they, when they go under, you just oh, no, I'm make it with different companies. Oh, no, I'm selling the names also because I know it's a robot. Oh, so nice to meet you. Thank 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 you. Chris, before you go, yeah. if I may just yeah, uh, share with the board that Chris has been with the Water Waste Water Committee for, uh, not committee, uh, department for a number of years and has been at the head for two years now, uh, year, and year, and year and a half. So uh, he, my manager is all doing a great job, uh, but Chris has really found opportunities to make the department more efficient, more effective. We are finding these problems because Chris has been really pushing his, his team to do that um, and regularly come <coughs> with ideas and suggestions for how to make his department better. Uh, so I just wanted to share that with the board of his good work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Next up, we have the assembly permit and banner for the rec department. One of my other really good directors is here to talk about some of the activities that she is uh, uh, proposing, and she's been working hard with members of the community um, on building density in the village and in the business districts, and some of these um, assembly permits are hoping to do just that uh, for different events. Um, so I will, uh, if the chair would be okay with, would ask Heidi to speak about this. Sure. Okay. <laughs> uh, sure, last month I, I brought it to your attention, um, and so this month I'm bringing the permits up, and so I'm just here if you, uh, if any of you have any questions regarding the events that are both being proposed. Uh, safe and seen, uh, there is that change of closing down the street, a lot of it is for the safety of the kids and also to create more of a community sense. Um, and then the winter lights parade as well. There are different road segments being closed though. Yes. Right? For both each of them is different. The safe and safe <laughs> is the segment of of um, Main Street. Right? Salisbury, yeah, and then and uh, Pleasant. Right. Yes. Again. And the parade um, is uh, much smaller than the Fourth of July. Um, worked out with the Lieutenant Scott. I, I always forget how to Clu pronounce it. Huh? Clu 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 Stop Clu Clu um, he, uh, we walked through that parade route and he was very satisfied with that. Um, so working with them. I did um, communicate also, I had several meetings with Bill Morgan, oh, now with the highway. Um, he mentioned that um, he is okay with all that as well. He just probably would recommend having no parking signs on one side of Merchant Road just to help out those big trucks if they need to turn on there. Um, and since these are two, uh, well, safe and seen closing down the streets, it's a new event, um, and the parade is a new event, kind of. Um, I did tell both the sheriff and the highway that I would be putting out more signs on the light post on Monday. So giving citizens, residents notice three days in advance that, and businesses, they, they're all aware of it, but at least people who park there on a regular basis, uh, a three day notice that we are closing down the streets for Halloween uh, from four to six, and then also for the parade, giving them enough time because it is a night parade. So I think that I'm used to doing those signs before. <laughs> um, I know we haven't done that, but I think it's very important to bring that and put those signs up, so giving people notice that um, we, we do need it cleared out. So hopefully that helps out too. And the signs will also be on some of the main businesses like the banks and stuff like that, and they're all for it. Some of the conversations that spurred additional work with the Sheriff's Department uh, were part of communications that Shannon and Heidi have had with um, our fire chief uh, in the village. So he had some specific questions about movement within the village, how things are gonna work, and um, again, much of the work that has happened since those communications are directly related to conversations or email exchanges that have had, um, that, have hap that have happened because of uh, communication between our team and the village fire department. And they're all on board, everybody's okay? Well, I'm still, uh, I, I've been out of town this weekend, so I need to follow up to see if all the questions have been addressed. Um, I have not heard from the fire chief. I've exchanged emails. So uh, no, I, you just no, the sheriff. no major concerns. I have yet to um, let Jay know about the updates. Okay. So he signed approving yeah. one. Yeah. Just okay. the other. Nothing out of the ordinary. Okay. Let's get a way around. Yeah, and we'll see, you know, the safe and scene, we'll see how it works. If it works, great. And if it doesn't, then we'll put it back <laughs> the way it was. We'll so, move on something else, right? yeah, okay. moving on to something else, but we are willing to give it a try. Um, I think um, people are very excited about sounds it. Sounds good to me. You need a motion for one of these in the front or both of them? Can you both in I'll make a motion to approve both these assembly permit applications. Second. And the banner. And the banner. I'll second that too. Okay. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, guys. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you, honey.
Next, we have a briefing by Smith Barney. We have our representative from uh, Smith Barney here today, and we also Morgan have Stanley. Morgan Stanley. I'm sorry. Uh, Smith Barney left long ago. <laughs> uh, that's oh, right. My uh, code still says Smith Barney. I just remember that. Okay. It's okay. fine. <laughs> uh, we thought it would be a good idea to share some general information with the board of uh, uh, two matters. One is a more recent development that the town was notified uh, of, and also just uh, some general information about the town's investments. That's correct. So uh, for the record, um, Chris Duby is with, uh, with Morgan Stanley, who was acquired by Smith, uh, Smith Barney was acquired by Morgan Stanley back in the 2008-2009 uh, time frame. Uh, we've been uh, assisting with your uh, uh, town investments for some time in a, in a portfolio, you know, people hear uh, companies like Morgan Stanley and Smith Barney and Merrill Lynch and the others and often think that you know we're, we're uh, looking to take risk. In your portfolio, we've really been risk averse uh, because these are town funds, these are public funds, and that's, that's been the premise. So we have had uh, a portion of the dollars, just a small portion, invested in the equity marketplace, but by and large, the uh, majority has been in uh, fixed income instruments and navigated the waters pretty well with three year rates of return. You've got four different accounts, um, each one having a little different um, uh, desire for, for rate of return. But the average rate of return over, over three years has been uh, around 5% a year. So fairly mild kinds of rates of return, but that goes with the very conservative risk profile. I will say that over the past three years, we haven't. Um, done much inside the portfolio because it's been working. That does mean that the equity portion, just because equities have gone up, have gotten a little bit bigger in the portfolio. So a potential consideration would be to sell off some of those uh, equities, buy some other fixed income instruments, uh, CDs or, or something else. Um, timing of the maturity of those um, goes point in, in hand with the second announcement that, that uh, was alluded to, and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, our thought process on the marketplace right now is you're looking at fixed income rates going up. It's causing a headwind against most fixed <laughs> income instruments. And the tailwind we've experienced in the equity marketplace, seems we seem to be having some volatility this year that, that is causing that to sputter a bit. So um, some uh, movement of the portfolio into, into things that have set maturities is uh, indeed a, a recommendation. Why set maturities? Even if there's fluctuation in those price held to maturity, you get you get your dollars back. Much like, uh, and in many cases, for some of our other institutions, we've been uh, municipalities, we've been doing certificates of deposit uh, for that. So essentially, just what you're you're hearing, a FDIC insured certificate of deposit um, for safety's sake, given the the current market conditions and market volatility. Um, but as part of that, uh, Morgan Stanley, in doing a legal review of the municipal marketplace, um, is actually exiting the uh, marketplace of assisting municipalities in these investments. And the biggest component of that is the fact that at, at the same time we're helping municipalities invest their dollars, we're also helping municipalities uh, issue uh, fixed income debt instruments, municipal bonds. And um, we see that as a conflict of interest, and we want to exit the, the marketplace so we don't have that conflict of interest. We can't be on both sides of, of the transaction. Clearly, in your case, we're not investing any proceeds of municipal bonds, but it's in general we're exiting uh, the space. So the only municipal clients that we will have going forward will be uh, retirement plans, essentially, uh, pension plans, 403, uh, 457 plans for, for government. Some governments have 403Bs. Um, and um, so that notification you received formally last week uh, we are clearly not going to leave you in the lurch. We're going to be here as you search for transition. <laughs> um, happy to even act as sounding board as you're going through an RFP process if that's what you decide to do. Um, we can't run the RFP for you, but we clearly can, can help you with appropriate questions. We can help you with vetting the, the solution set. Um, if you'd like us to look through proposals, we're happy to do that for you um, as well. You'll um, find that the national um, Investment houses have all made this decision. We were actually, as I understand it, the last one uh, to, to move in this direction uh, after most of the others did, did that uh, two and three years ago. Um, so all in all, the experience has been uh, exactly what we wanted for you from a, from a rate of return and a risk profile, and it's working quite well for my personal satisfaction. Would love to be able to, to continue 
uh, helping the, the local community, we're just not in a position to be able to do that. We're exiting it on a, on a national scale. So that exit um, is uh, 180 days from an, a letter that was sent out October 1st. So you, you do have some time to find and research solutions. Some of the other um, municipalities, we, we've been doing this in a staggered format. Some of the other municipalities we've looked to have found good homes for their investments at local trust departments, local banks, and, and independent, uh, some independent investment locations. So uh, things like Trust Company of Vermont, and local banks that you live and work next to all day long um, are certainly in a position of helping you with this. And they're not folks who are in that municipal bond space, so there isn't that conflict of interest potential. In your case, there has been no conflict of interest, to be clear, but um, we have to, uh, in this day and age, we have to just move completely away from anything that even optically looks that way. What's our target for that fund? Or like how long we intended to have it out there? Um, well, we don't have, it's basically a combination of things, but Joyce, you're the fund was established back in 1998, 99 um, from the landfill depreciation funds mm -hmm. from the closure of the landfill. And at that point we had, I think around three million that we invested. Um, right now, we're down to two million something. Two point one, I think. Mm -hmm. um, the largest part of it is in the depreciation fund, but there's like I think eight hundred thousand that's in the closure fund, um, which is meant for paying the expenses for the closure of the landfill. And because uh, when we originally established that. Um, they were estimating that we would have to monitor and report up to 20 years. After we established how much we had in the fund, we found out we, I think it's now up to 30 years that we have to monitor it. So we ended up having to put more money into it to be sure that we had sufficient funds to cover us to, I think it's 2030 something. Um, that we have to have sufficient funds for monitoring and paying for expenses related to the landfill closure. Um, so over the years, we've used those funds as a means of um, supplementing our capital um, construction funds, um, using borrowing some money, or actually using some money from the funds uh, for a while there was like a hundred to two hundred thousand per year we were taking out that we were using towards highway projects and other projects so that we didn't actually have to bond for those particular amounts. Since then we've done more bonding than using funds from the uh, landfill depreciation fund. So we still have a sufficient significant amount of money in the funds. Um, it originally was targeted to go out to, I think, some of the investments we have go to like 2025 or something like that. Um, we have one particular one that was set up um, for a balloon payment on a bond payment, which is coming due, I believe, in November. Um, the balloon payment is a little over $200,000. We originally invested uh, um, less than that, but the fund grew so that we had um, actually quite a bit more and we've actually used some of the excess of the funds for other projects. Uh, we, you know, we had voter approval to, to use the excess funds for other particular projects that we have for the town. Um, so going forward, um, because we have a target date of March 29 that we have to move the funds to something else, um, you know, we have locally, we have um, Edward Jones, we, we can approach them to see what they can or cannot do for us. Um, I know that when we originally did the whole process of um, soliciting different entities for investing the money, um, we did actually contact a couple different banks that had um, <coughs> brokerage type services within their, their uh, business model. Um, so we can probably approach some of them. Um, Pe People's United is one of them, but probably we would not go with them because we do actually have bonds with People's United. Um, but um, I believe Northfield has um, a brokerage mm -hmm. 
portion of their business, and I believe there's a couple other banks that have similar things. So we can approach these different banks. Um, you know, when we do our RFP, we can go to the banks, we can go to Edward Jones, um, you know, and um, just see what they have available and what they can do for us, um, you know, and, and uh, go from there. I know that Dolphin is looking at uh, restructuring some of the funds that are in uh, those investments um, to try and either grow them more or to uh, reallocate how we're using them. Um, there, there are some funds that are specific um, because uh, some of the investments are for um, Grant Park, um, which was uh, for basically the, the their income generating um, investments so that the whatever money is being generated from them are being used for expenses related for upkeep and uh, and what <coughs> in park um, there was also um, money that was specifically for the playground that was invested um, I think we've actually spent the money but we haven't liquidated the funds um, so the funds are still in in the investment um, you know, basically, the, we haven't done a lot of activity. Basically, it was set up and we've let it ride, and and it's done very well for us. Um, you know, like like Chris said, most of it has been um, set up to be very conservative, but to to give us a return. Um, it, it's not necessarily a, a whopping return, but it, it's significant enough that we've actually made money on various different funds and, and actually have been able to use the excess to do other things so the type of investment it's in is it in a pooled investment so you would Some actually liquidate yeah what it's, the holdings it, are most of them would be transferable to the institutions that you that you've just talked about so you wouldn't necessarily have to liquidate but mm -hmm. but listening to whoever your next advisor is if they have different ideas that you want to pay attention to um, if you were to liquidate, they are all liquid, uh, meaning they are all easily uh, right. transferable right. to cash anytime you wanted to. So, so nothing not is tied Morgan up. It's not a Morgan Stanley specific no, fund that not at all. We, we would not do that. Okay. No, the, the, the funds are, there are a variety of different funds. There's a, a couple of different um, American capital fund. There, there's the Thornburg investment. Um, there is um, Franklin uh, fund. Um, there, there are a number of different mutual funds, and, and there are, like he said, there are some, some um, equities. We, um, some of the investments for the landfill closure are in like Eli Lilly and um, what's the other one? I'm drawing like um, Hydro Quebec. Um, so, no wonder they did so well. <laughs> right, so some, of, some of the items that you know we, we would hope to bring to the board at some point in the future is uh, one, a proposal to establish Town of Randolph Infrastructure Bank, so that we, because we have this after we put enough money away, to complete the closure of the landfill, which uh, Joyce spoke about, roughly about eight hundred thousand dollars, it would relieve us with over a million dollars. Establish a. Uh, uh, a town of Randolph infrastructure bank where we could borrow from ourselves, pay ourselves back, and prevent from having to go back out to the bond bank because then we're locked into 20, 30 years worth of debt service and payment. Um, and if we were then to just ask the town to lend us their money, pay it back, we could complete infrastructure projects in a much um, faster way. Mm -hmm. And we would then always have that same pool of money without having to pay a uh, debt service. Like a new pool? Yeah, uh, so it could be a new reserve account. Uh, it could be a different way. <laughs> I'm telling you, you got to fix it. And that's the money that you could probably so, fix it. So, if if created the the proper way, similar to our emergency reserve fund, where if monies are used, then any leftover or surplus for the previous for the following year is used to uh, reimburse that account. We can have a similar system with this particular project. Um, a lot of the town's annual taxation goes to pay for debt service and it's tens of thousands, of hundreds of thousands of dollars per year to pay off some of these bonds. Mm -hmm. And if we switch to a model where we borrow from ourselves, uh, not, not, our, not set ourselves up in these 
funds where they are two or three out, years out of maturity, but <coughs> cycle these funds on a, on a regular basis, you could do a lot more with that money. But that's for a different meeting, just because okay. Joyce brought it up. And it is an option. Yeah, I'd like to hear more about that at some point. From sure. the, we have a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Thank you. Thanks for the heads up. Chris. We learned a lot about our town today. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> mm. I do a lot of these meetings. I'm not used to it. I miss it. And Chris, what was your last name? Dude. D-U-D-I-E. Thank you. You're welcome. Stuff is the proposed agreement from New England Central. Do we have anybody here on that item? Yes. No one from New England Central here today. Um, okay. Property, what are people waiting for? You're waiting for the EV charging stations, which is in old in the grants. Anybody else waiting for a specific item? You're here for the duration? Yeah. No, the one behind you? Yeah. Uh, I was here for the road issue. Okay. So I'm not the process. Right. We're only talking process on that one. That's all. Just I'm, just, I'm just hanging okay. out. All right. Um, so we move up the let's EV drop charging. down yeah, and talk uh, EV charging. Do we have something on that? Here, <laughs> I'll make you sit here the rest of the day. Only if you're going to go cook dinner. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my first thing up here. Okay. I'm working with the R3 group and um, um, uh, just the R3 committee and learning from them about this particular grant that's become available. We ask that they help us by uh, doing some research, working with Green Mountain Power, continuing work with John Copan, who's been leading the R3 process. Um, and, and um, the group has sent to the select board their findings. Um, so in your packet for this particular item is the grant, or at least the introduction portion to the grant, and then also a cost breakdown of what it would cost the town through its 10% um, contribution if the select board were to approve us <coughs> further uh, investigating this potential option. Um, and so we have representatives here to speak about it a little bit more. Yeah. Well, um, I think what's before you, since you already have it, largely s says what we would like you to know. Um, if you've had a chance to read it, I'm not going to belabor it. Um, we've already heard about this several times before from an old program that never got adopted. And uh, one or two months ago, we came to give you some warning that this was coming. And it's really more of an opportunity to let the town know what's available and to make what we think is a kind of a no-brainer recommendation. But it's it's something that the town and the selector can take or leave. It really is not a huge monetary item or a revenue generator either way. It's more of a way, as I see it, to give rid of some branding statewide and even regionally to count traffic that might be coming from Quebec, which is real big in the EVs in the near future, and also to give us a reputation as maybe a leader in, in, a, in this direction. So, um, yeah, yeah, I'm going to leave it in that unless you would have anything. What well, are you I, coming down to for locations? Well, so we, we thought we'd like to hear any input that you guys had on that obviously this isn't our program this is a town program and it would be an investment in our community and ultimately we'd be looking to the select board to be a player on that um, front and so just some some of the locations that we've mentioned here in the spreadsheet are town hall summer street pleasant street and prince street um, as ones that we've identified, but, and we've just thought about that from a business standpoint for parking. Uh, we've thought about that from a uh, electrical hookup standpoint. There are some parameters to the actual EV charger and what it, what it needs to meet. Um, has to be handicap accessible. Um, 
various other things like that. So that's why we've identified those locations. Um, obviously, it's, it's not our town, so we look to any insight on that front. Um, I'd say just it's a 10% <coughs> match for municipal uh, owned property and doesn't really get any better than that. Um, if you look at the numbers for the growth in electric vehicles, I know 80% of this board drives trucks, but um, <laughs> even electric <laughs> trucks are coming out too. Like I'm looking at an electric pickup uh, by Workhorse. And so I think it would be really important for um, Randolph not to miss this as an opportunity. From a marketing standpoint, um, we've talked to people in the community and kind of pulled folks. Uh, we don't have any hard numbers on that yet uh, about whether they would support it, business folks, uh, people along Main Street and whatever, but um, we it, it'll show up on your Google Maps, on your, on your ways as a place where you can charge your vehicle. And I think for the downtown Randolph, that would be a good thing, but um, as a forward-thinking community, I think it's also important, and we hope that you guys will approve the opportunity for us to apply for the or for the town to apply for the grant. And I think uh, through the R three process, there's a lot of resources um, in terms of helping make it happen. So I want to say two other things about location. Um, put this in the context that whether the town does this or not. There's also going to be very likely um, charger stations to at least two at Gifford, maybe four, two at BTC, and I don't know the locations exactly for any of those. Um, the supervisory union somewhere probably at the tech center is probably going to do it too, but they're a little bit behind in, the, in their planning. So all these other entities are gearing up for this November 30, I think it is, deadline for the RFP. And um, there's resources that will help the town do this application, but it's still going to be some commitment by the town. I mean, you know all about how those applications for the state work. There's, there's, there's plenty of paperwork <laughs> and, and in-kind work. And in-kind work does count if, sometimes for the 10% match, by the way, too. The other thing I'm going to push a little bit on location, that the town is going to do it, um, giving us any direction tonight or in the very near future, not waiting till the next meeting would help. Because I think we could give you a more actionable proposal. There is no proposal that's ready for action tonight. And that's mostly because the vendors that go with the RFP process are not really known to us yet. There's pieces of the program that are still emerging. And so mm -hmm. um, we're so not asking you to do to anything tonight, except if you have some direction about which of the spots we've identified, or maybe another one, that seem most likely we could fo focus our energy into further exploring feasibility there. On the spreadsheet, you have two level twos at Town Hall, and then you have one level three and one level three at Town Hall. Is that's that one type, level two and one level three? Yes, it is. That's a typo, sorry. So what, I'm sorry, so what's it supposed to be? One, oh, one, one of each. One, one two, each. one, three. One, so two, and it, one, three. Okay. It ends up costing around $8,500 for the town to put in a level three? Well, this... For an annual operating cost? Um, here's the scoop on level three, and this is driving me crazy. The level threes is clearly, to me, going to be the wave of the future and what is going to be probably standard in a pretty short period of time. It's kind of like the software world where it changes every few years. Um, but right now, if you look at those prices, it's like 85000 wasn't it? It was something very high for the level 3 charging. It, it's DC, so it's a whole different power setup. It's relatively enormous amount of power that gets dumped into, essentially changed from one device to another. And so it takes a very different set of infrastructure and the device itself that does it. And I think it's just not very w 
much in the mainstream yet, and so the, the prices are high. And if you also look at the annual consumption prices, I just don't get it. Maybe some of the engineers can explain it, but it should be, seems to me, about the same amount of power used to charge a battery, whether it's fast in one hour or long in six or eight hours. But they make it seem like it's a lot more power. So I don't get it. So you get the conversion factor. Yeah. Yeah. Right, AC to DC is going to be the challenge. Yeah. So there's a price you pay on energy loss during that. Plus, if you're drawing in a shorter amount of time, higher current, that puts a higher um, yeah. load on the entire system rather than doing a slower charge. But I 100% agree with you that the level three stations are going to be those the common. Those are going to be the standard. They're going to be the standard. And just think about, okay, now I've got to come to town and sit there for three hours charging my vehicle versus right. 30 minutes. Right. You know, there's a a use factor there too and I would argue that you know an example is if you go down to West Lebanon and look at the I forget is it the Walmart parking lot that has the, te the yep, test that's they're never normal. used yeah right because you got to sit there for three hours and charge it right you know and yeah. there's not a lot of people that are willing and to do that there's, so. the yeah, there's people who um, are promoting the level two charges the, the, this kind of the standard thing that most towns are doing um, because it's going to bring people into town and people are going to stay and shop. And I'm not sure I really believe that. I, I don't think coming for a six hour charge is all that attractive. That's not going to draw very much. That's a hotel. <laughs> it, employee is different. That's the, that's the or, hotel. Or okay. The hotel rights. is going to be a level. Rights. It's okay. that level. We okay. installed yeah. the yeah. Whereas, but if somebody coming to spend an hour or two in the village. For overnight or an employee coming to work, yeah. it's, it's a whole different ball game. That's a different so, thing. So I think. But there are people who the could right thing, if we were really proactive, would be to bite the bullet and pay for the expensive one. But I have a hunch that with these prices, that we're, we'd be doing it prematurely. It's going to be cheaper soon. But the grant might where's not be your, that Where's way. your cost come from? Yeah, that's a good where question. were these generated from? Or two. It comes from a deposit by the same pay. Right. the same revenue? We're that charging the, the same for quick charge as we are a six hour charge? Yeah. If you can come up with some better figures, I can, we're all for it. I can give you more accurate numbers. We actually installed eight level twos in a park and ride in, in Rockingham last year. So I can give you some better info. Yeah, sweet. Yeah, because they seem very round to me. They use them all the time. That's for sure. Yeah. This park and ride went in. And are you going to charge the same often. for a level two charge as a level three well, charge? Well, that's another thing that is unknown. The that's the best the information same. that we had. Um, and it doesn't make any sense what you're going to be able to charge probably five times as much, I would think. But you're not going to charge more than a tank of gas, probably. So it's going to be somewhere more than the $5, but less than $30, I think, is what you're really going to charge. I'd like to see your numbers. I mean, I'm all for this. I just don't know what level we need to be at. So I have yeah. no problem sending them off and saying, hey, let's move forward here, but I would love to see the numbers that you guys had. I'll reach out to the owner's rep that did the project for And I think this is a super great opportunity for sure. My, my challenge is the locations picked. Um, mm -hmm. If one of your two benefits are drawing customers to downtown and creates an image of Randolph as a poor looking town, that's all great. But if we're hiding it back here at the town hall, you know, off of Main Street where it's not visible even right now, people are going to have to search for it and all that other stuff. And I know Google's there, don't get me wrong. Right. Um, you know, trying to get it out in the open, visible, et cetera, would be, I think, a huge benefit. Yeah. The merchants are wicked against it. Only because of parking. Nobody's because in Bell Mains right now. They yeah. can't be against it. <laughs> well, you can't put it through there. No, I'm playing. It's not no, handicapped. Just playing. Yeah. Right. Perfect. Right. I, I hear you. The only way you're going to have them anywhere on Main the Street is to get rid of the handicapped spots. In front of Chef's Market, right? In the Chef's Market, you get it. It's not handicapped. Isn't there a handicap access there? you got an 8-inch curb. you got to have a quarter-inch reveal or, or less. The grant covers so the only place that you can put them is where there's actually <laughs> handicapped spots already. So well, you have and then to there's also handicapped the spots to put them in. Problem with diagonal. Street. So you're looking at right aid, the municipal lot, the bigger lots. Because it's there, not handicapped there's accessible. A, there's a good oh, number of reasons so like why because you have to be able to super attractive right, right. off the bat. Get there. We also don't want to discriminate against folks who drive, you know, diesel pickups. Who those are going to be no longer can park there because. There's an EV charger there. Okay. You know what I mean? So I think I agree with you 100%. Um, I think there's probably some compromise that we can make through signage uh, to make them more known. I mean, there is great parking out here. 
and but Prince Street may be better. Who knows? So, but we'd just love to communicate with you guys more on the on this matter, and uh, bring you some better information for next meeting. And when's it have to be applied for by? End of November. End of November. November thirty. So yeah, there's one more. So a little forty-five time. days. Yeah. All right. Well. But do you have to pick the locations at that point, or are you just submit, submitting the application and you can leave the locations? I th I think we'll have I think we will have to probably pick some locations. Okay. Okay. Location is going to change the cost. I have to look sure. at the application to answer that question. This, yeah, okay. Well, I'm I'm certainly yeah. All right. Well, I'm all for it. So I'd say keep moving forward and see if we can make it happen. Is, is there any data on how? the charging stations get used in terms of whether they're spread out or, or bunched up. So it's like if I was coming to town, one here, one there. I would, would love to go to like, I, I would think one spot where there was a bunch of them, knowing that at least maybe one of them is going to be free rather than yeah. going to one spot where there's two of them and they're both taken and then I'm like, oh, where's the other one I drive around? And right. I know those are taken. Oh, oh, there's the one that's free. Like the parking garage, you know? Wouldn't want four parking garages. You should have one so everybody knows where it is, correct? Yeah. Right. The, the difficult... Yeah, we can look for some numbers like that. The difficulty is, it's like Burlington would be a place that has mm -hmm. those multiple chargers in one location. Of course, we're on a way different metric than Burlington, yeah. so you know, we don't have that same foot traffic. That right. traffic. What are you feeling? Are you feeling you should, that it should be one location? That, that, I mean, that would be my intuition. I just don't know if yeah. people have you know done any, any if there's been any data out there about so it. Mine's the same way as yours. I think it should be like one location if you had two or three or four or whatever, you had the ability to expand if you needed to, would be also something you should think about. Yeah. Because sure. you might want to expand in that same area as things progress, so. Would it, That's a good idea. Would, it, park would, the, would the board uh, be opposed to maybe the R3 committee reaching out to the other partners in the town that are already considering installing these at different locations and potentially asking them to partner with the town so that you know, we you think the challenge is that if uh, these stations are put into on private property or on nonprofits, the the rate is different than if right. the town were to use you know municipal lots, uh, much lower contribution. So we could, if the board was okay with it, uh, and if the committee were open to it, speak with these partners and say, well, we could potentially have two or three parking spots in a municipal lot that has space available because we may have a car that's abandoned there, we can get rid of it. Um, but they would then fit the bill for it because now they're paying less per device because we're using municipal property. So it's more of a partnership where we I think then. some of theirs, they have the Giffords, the schools, BTC or the tech center, they have people that are there all day. So a level two makes perfect sense for them. Mm -hmm. Our issue is going to be that it, a one level two and one level three option is probably the better way to go because you got some employees or folks that work for different I, businesses that would. Adult, well, I think we heard explicitly that the state wants you to not mix the type of energy. So they don't want a municipal with a it's institutional, but because of the different um, amount of copay or. Sure. Um, Subsidy for that. And as, you know, locations are pretty different too. Good question. Can, can I inject? I don't know the protocol here. Um, but what about asking Tom Cooch or anybody else that we know in town that has an electric vehicle what kind of input they might have as to the location that would work? Shannon's going to want your name. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Martha Hafner. Thank you. Yeah, so we've been trying to pull um, folks on that front as well. Um, most people who invest in an electric car either know that they can charge it at work or... Or they're making uh, the investment in a home station, right? Correct. Yeah, the ones I think they're coming to time. town are going to be more like, you know, come to shop or coming to go to the Voice of King or, you know, somebody's making a trip into the community, right? Yeah. And the other thing to keep in mind, I think, is that when someone is coming to charge, they don't necessarily need to charge completely, you know, from a dead battery all the way to a right. full battery. They might be okay with a 30-minute charge that gets them another 20 miles up the road, yeah. you know, yeah. to, their, to where they need to go. So point. it might be okay for certain people, at least, to, to have access. They might find a level 2 charger to be perfectly adequate, even though they're only spending an hour shopping or something like that. One 
Yeah, but you're going to want to condition the battery, right? Well, you're going to want to go from dead to full. Otherwise, you lose the full capacity. Not unless it comes down to work. Doesn't work that way. You typically don't want to discharge those batteries from a Google Maps standpoint. Yeah. from doing that too often. So yeah. I agree. Just coming in to chop the top off. Is it, if, if the board is open to this, um, I could continue to work with the group to nail down some very specific answers to questions that the board may have. Uh, we can do a lot of preliminary work between now and the next meeting of the select board. And if at that point we provide the board with satisfactory answers, the board can then authorize uh, me and staff to work with the group to apply for the grant. Um, but between now and then, we could be working on everything we need for that moment, and then we could meet and pull it together. Sounds and then we'll like have it. some very clear answers for the board, and uh, hopefully help to make that decision. Sounds like a good idea. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Thanks, guys. Let me know when they make one. Thank you. Charge your truck. Do the work of a diesel. <laughs> 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 I'm waiting for those big semi. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not some, uh, uh, yeah. Coming to the <laughs> yeah, they have, I know. I've been watching that, following that for a while. Okay. Proposed agreement from New England Central. Um, uh, so the town, town staff has recommenced a conversation with New England Central over the condition of Railroad Street. Uh, we have shared with them uh, photographs of what the road looked like before uh, Jack Cowdery actually spent, he, uh, he and another uh, resident spent some money to grade the road, make it uh, a little better than it was before. So, was well, that where that recent work came from? They yeah, that? yeah okay. it was Jack Cowdery and another member of the community. Um, we have had on are a regular they, basis. Are they property owners? Jack is. Yeah, Jack is, yeah. So a portion of a portion of Railroad Street is currently Class Three, and it is the west, the eastern portion of Railroad Street. So essentially, by almost by the real estate, by the real estate portions of it. Yeah, the homes, the apartments. I uh, believe it ends where Shane Miles owns the red burnt down property. Uh, oh, then, oh, I have it backwards. That, yeah, the other side. Okay. And yeah, the, not else. Yeah, it's and it's private from Al's Pizza and curves onto North Main. Um, we have approached again New England Central Rail and asked them to work with us. They have pulled together an agreement um, that puts a lot of, it requires a lot from the town. It requires us to put in a guardrail uh, that would prevent any plowing of snow to end up on the tracks. It would require the town to run maintenance plans or maintenance of the road plans with New England Central Rail to make sure that what we do doesn't affect their rail operation. Um, at this point, I had these conversations with New England Central Rail. I bring the agreement to the select board so I can at the very least have some input on what the board would like for me to push back on. They're open to negotiating. They've already agreed to not charge us the $365 a day or per year fee for the lease. <coughs> um, but if there were any other points that the board wanted me to bring back to New England Central Rail, we could, we could do that. Um, I just wanted to let the board know that we're this conversation is ongoing and is yeah. Is there, on the on the class three side, is there currently a guardrail on on that stretch? There is none on um, that portion of. But um, that's their land too. It's their land. That's not our land. No, but I thought that was. I thought you said. Oh, the class three portion is 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 also theirs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so there's a map at the back of that. So, so we can, just... but we can plow that section, but we. No, we do, but we can't. We do, but we can't. We do. We do. We, we, so we do just because we want to. We, nobody has. As we have for years. Nobody's told us not to. Yeah, because I was about to say because the uh, the other section this past winter there was a huge pile of snow. Yep, yep. Right in the middle of it, but in previous winters. That was all clear. You could drive through that whole that whole stretch yep. from from Pleasant to Main Street. Um, so what's wrong with the what's wrong with the status quo? I mean as long as we can stop putting a big pile of snow. <laughs> in, so in we the, have no space. it's not legal it none of it's legal for the town to be using right now. It belongs to the railroad. 
and so and there's the upkeep of the road itself isn't being done by the railroad or by the town so when it rains the water's running right into the basement of the curves building mm -hmm. and somebody's got to fix it mm -hmm. so um, yeah, Dallas parking lot is and, and, terrible yeah. Yeah. and with with the, the grading floor. that was done by these private parties did they do so with permission of the Railroad? I doubt it. No. No, to even walk within 50 feet of the center line, you need a permit. <laughs> they didn't have flaggers. They didn't flags. have anything. They had, nothing. they had nothing they needed to be doing. Okay, they just did it. So one of my communications so, to the railroad, because they're insisting on a guardrail, I said, well, if we work with you and you don't insist on certain things, at the moment, anyone can do what they're afraid of, which is plow snow onto the road or onto the, the, Track. the tracks. Um, so they're asking us to perform certain steps in order to prevent certain things from happening, but I reminded them that could happen now. We're just trying to help you, and I think they're just worried about the long-term legal portion of it, which is why they're so focused on this agreement. What's the cost of the guardrails? Yeah, I was gonna say, what's that figure out of? We have a general estimate of, for that section of road, between five and ten thousand um, dollars, roughly about seventy-five hundred. Uh, that I received from Chuck Goodwin from D and K, and it was just more of like just a basic estimate. So, so is that then the whole stretch from Main Street to Pleasant? Yes, okay. on that side of of rail, uh, road, of, well, on that side of the road. Mm -hmm. But the whole reconstruction the, through there to address the stormwater issue and all that is a lot more. Yeah. So the issue that's gone back to the railroad because um, Adolfo shared this with me and I went back to him and I'm like, hey guys, this stormwater issue is yours. This is your liability and you need to get in here and fix it. What the town's offering to do is step up and lease this land and keep it maintained and you know help you with this issue. So it's gone back to their property folk and some of their upper <coughs> to look at them participating in the cost of addressing this liability the, that's there the, the problem. all they're going to do is put fill in there and slant it to the ditch in the railroad mm -hmm. and then it won't be usable by anybody and we don't want that mm. no. so if we want that to be a through street and we want it to be able to connect the two we want it flat semi-flat slant it towards drainage what was the cost of the whole project? I remember, just I, refresh my memory, do we have a number on that? I don't have a number on the total cost for the road, uh, just on the guardrail. But the road itself would require some stormwater yeah, diversion. Yeah, you got to do some stormwater work. And, and something, yeah. And Can we just drop so Jersey barriers on it and set the guardrails and make them happy? Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's that's a option. No, because it does um, move easier when you plow. The plow blade will float on the guardrails, but it'll push those jersey bears right out of the way. So we don't want those on the train track. No. So is this going to be a one-way road? Because I don't think we have 24 feet between the right-of-way and the and the uh, <laughs> curves building. Yeah, the it's going to be a one-way road, right? <laughs> <laughs> it says it's 29.5 right there, but then they get this encroachment here. So the original intent was it was to be one way going towards Pleasant Street, and Great. then one of those, huh? Back like Street would be going towards Main Street. So back street is so we can make Merchants Road two way. <laughs> Take out all the parking. <laughs> Getting late. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> You're on vacation. This won't uh, yeah. be wide enough yeah. to be two way. No, no, it won't be. No, it's not going to be two way. So you just pick a way, pick a direction. Probably, like you said, going towards South Pleasant. But remember, back street is not a town road either. No, same as on that. Same as on. I think you want to keep that street. At least at this case, if you release that from the railroad, you probably got to be okay because the worst case scenario, Sam shuts it down, then you yeah, at least yeah, make it look bad. Right? Sam owned it. Oh, um, yeah. The, yeah. We have it, they have received visitors from people who use that road. You know, I'm sure we would have to speak with them about the one way directional because right now people are using it. They go any direction. Two cents any direction. It's Whatever it happens to be on that road. Yeah. Does it affect the trash guy collector at all? Yep. He won't yeah. be there. 
It already does. She just ignores it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so what if we leased it and just turned one end and the other end into two separate parking lots with no through traffic? Because we already got two one ways 50 feet away. Yeah. Put a charging station in. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> two birds. The charging station's there. Two birds. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Uh, make that a motion? Solving problems. <laughs> <laughs> There's some people yeah. up with solving problems. <laughs> they come and drop their trash off, charge their car. <laughs> well, you Gonna need a level four. Really. Well, one section's in front of a bunch of private residences, right? They need parking. And the other section is in front of House Pizza, which needs parking. That's, this lot, that lot is often full of cars coming and going. That's actually not a bad idea, parking. No parking, right? I could reach out to them. I, I do know that they have, although they don't feel that they would exercise it, but one of their standard clauses um, that is included in their proposed agreement is a, a 30 day cut and run. So we have that. So we could do, so do all this work and then it could be like, all right, see ya. Yeah. I mean, Adolfo, what do you mean by that? That they could just give us 30 day notice of the ending of this agreement and right. then the town would have to go away and the railroad then just takes full possession of the road. Thank Putting you. any improvements? Any in? improvements become their property. Mm -hmm. but Probably all the more reason standard. to make them pay for a portion of the improvements. Yeah. I, I could, I've tried stressing to them that what they're afraid of can happen now and it can affect their operation. Um, and I could continue to do that and ask them to pitch in. Well, the request for them to pitch in is before their leadership oh, now. Okay. I mean, we're just waiting for a response. I mean, they could just say, we're just going to close it to all traffic, right? They could do that today. And they, they could, could do right, that that's what I'm saying. And they could fix their stormwater issue, and that'd be the end of it. But so there's there's incentive for us to... I think there's some value in the parking situation. ...to work with them. I mean, this has always been, you know, this Alice Pizza situation. That's kind of like a little tough situation there. There's always that, curves, and... You know, there's always a problem over there with parking. So, that's a great idea. It was mostly joking, so I'm glad you like it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's a joke. I think it's actually, I think it's actually a good idea. I have driven, to, to, to Mike and Perry's point, I have driven through the movie theater when it was you know, still open, um, and there weren't any parking spaces. There's no parking spaces. It was the so, whole section of... Or, Saint or South Main at that point. Could you have the staff look at that and see how many parking spaces that would create? I mean, if there were parking spaces on the railroad side of that. Yeah, right. Yeah, just if that was. Yeah. What could we What could we accomplish there? I mean, we theoretically could use more downtown parking spaces. I mean, like Adolfo said, you know, when the Playhouse is in operation, and I'm assuming it will be again. You know, there's always a struggle for parking spaces in that area. Which way it looks like there would only be a few spaces there. Cause they I don't know. It would be, be nice to see them. It's get, not wide enough to do. You got 29 feet. feet probably can't do. Probably not end with. A, not end with street. Uh, with Al's perpendicular parking as well, so probably not both. Mm -hmm. But I think there's usually six cars from the railroad crossing gate down to the uh, curbs building. About on a busy lunch. What's the length of that? I don't know. Mm -hmm. 350. There it is. Well, you can put an awful lot of cars parallel parked down there. Right? That'd be 17. Parallel or angled? I don't think you can do angled, but I think parallel, you could get 17. Is you it wide park. enough from the edge of the curves building to the line they're drawing? I don't know. I don't know what that, link, that, that dimension is. You could make that, that could be no parking area. Cur the, the encroachment of curves, <laughs> you know, parking, you could probably still pick up 12 parking spaces. That distance is, we're good. If you do that, right people are still going to drag through there. Huh? People will still drag through there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could, you, yeah, they will. Sorry, Mark. could put a barrier there. Then they won't be driving. They'll have to park one side or the other, right? <laughs> so, so sorry, right. what do we really need for you, for you right now? What do you need from us? Um, I wanted really just to get a sense of the board if you were interested in me pursuing this and if you, uh, as a board, were interested in having me pursue it. 
what options you wanted me to investigate, like a parking lot. I can investigate the parking lot. I can ask, have staff measure the area, see how many spots Angular could fit in. Um, that obviously was not an option that I was considering until now, but you know, I could actually reach out to the railroad and say, this is what we're thinking about, this is what we'd like to do, continue to you know, push them along with the decision making for the proposal that they pitch in a little bit more, or pitch, any, pitch in anything at all. Um, essentially just wanted to get your guidance. So when they do the traffic study at Maple and Island, can we have them look at how many cars are going through there today? Or um, I don't know because it's private property, um, but we could... Maybe, maybe you just have them count on how many leave Main Street and how many can't show up on Pleasant Street? <laughs> It's 29 and a half feet. Yeah, 29 and a half feet wide, that's what it says. So, the yeah, parking space is 20 feet. In length. Yeah. So, you're 29 and a half feet. Is nine and a half feet enough to pull out and swing? Uh, no, no. How wide? 12 wide, right? Well, it depends. So, I was participating in a conference call on these EV charging stations, and I think I know where the little quip came about the diesel trucks, because mm -hmm. my comment was, <laughs> as we continue to change our look of our downtowns, we continue to make our parking spaces smaller, and mm -hmm. we continue to accommodate these little vehicles, forgetting that the a good chunk of the residents require trucks to do their jobs mm -hmm. for their work. And we're starting to cut them out of being able to park anywhere. And it, it's just, you see, I mean, I sat on the DRB for I don't know how many years, and the big joke between me and Mr. Manning, who used to be their facilities manager, was that, you know, he kept saying, well, we, we don't need these big parking spaces. And I said, I need you to look at what we're driving out there because out we do. Mm -hmm. um, so, mm -hmm. you know, you look at the standards and what our parking space standards are, I'm not sure that. They accurately reflect everybody being able to access them, and I don't know what the dimensions are for, you know, angled parking versus. Well, uh, I just have to have to have a ten to. by twenty space for, for their mosquito. They're both twenty feet out, but the angle ends up being twenty-two feet long. Twenty-two, but because, because of the angle, it's right. twenty feet. And what does it require, though, for clearance to for the cars the to make the swing to? Well, typically the uh, um, lane in between is, uh, I think it's 20, 20 feet, 20 feet, 20 feet is typically what we yeah, design to. So the, same, so the same perpendicular in between. But if it's a one-way lane, you only need a 12. Mm, you still need the length. You no, know, but you need, you, if, you're, if you're, I just did my plan, it was 24 feet was the angle park, and I needed 12 feet of aisle, I think is what I was told if I was going one way. So that's what I drew, and that's what they approved. So, so we need 36 you need, feet. You don't even quite have enough scenario, here to make this happen here if you anchor parked. Yeah. But if you parallel parked, you would. So, well, anyways, I'd be interested in hearing if they would entertain that. So, <coughs> you know, whether it be They're that, or whether doing it be a street, now. whatever. There is parallel parking and perpendicular parking at Owls right now. Yeah, that's. Yeah. yeah. The only challenge is what the distance is the railroads given us now and then when you put in the the actual the guardrail, guardrail. Yeah. So you might lose some of the guardrails. You're losing so that's some of the depth I think to their safety area. Yeah. But I think before we can say yay or nay, I think we gotta do a few things first to we gotta come out with what we would do mm -hmm. with that section. And then we need to get an answer out of them as to what they're willing to contribute. Because, yeah. I mean, right now we could say, hey, you know, you got a problem, you need to fix it. And they would need to come in and fix it, but I think we'd see them come in and fix it. Probably, we probably wouldn't like the results. Well, I mean, you can look at the current uh, projects in town here for numbers. You're probably looking at four catch basins and 400 feet of, of 18 to 24 inch storm pipe for stormwater system. And if you crown the road, you're looking at eight catch basins instead of four. And then you probably have to add manholes then, because you don't want them in line, you want them offline. So you're looking at four manholes and eight catch basins on a crowned road through there. I don't think we need it crowned, right? I think we want it to slightly slope towards the railroad. 
So if you put your kaiser basins on that side, you'd be good. I think it could cost us some money either way. Yeah, it's going to cost money either way. <laughs> well, it's probably 5000 bucks with catch basin yeah, yeah. for price and install. So you're looking at 20000 if you just slope it one way, yeah. not including the pipe. And then by the time you fix the material and pave it yeah. and put in the guardrail. Might just have to let the midnight rating crew continue to do what they're doing. <laughs> Lean on the railroad side. The railroad can fight with them. Okay. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. I, well, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get estimates. I'll yeah, I'll just get some numbers and see. Yeah, I'll share them later. All right, so next we have the property assessment process and cost. Uh, we thought it would be a good idea, just given some of the conversations that we've had about. Um, uh, current property assessments and then from one of our residents um, to the select board, previous select board meeting, Sam Samus, uh, wanted to share with the board a general cost. I wasn't able to get a specific cost from our listers office, but a general estimate for a townwide assessment. Um, we would look at roughly about two hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand uh, dollars. We currently have in our assessment reserve fund $189,000 and are expecting to have in fiscal year 23 $204,000. Um, one of the potential warnings that come up that I was asked to share with the select board is that if, if we were to, I should preface that by saying that we are not anywhere near at this time at the place where we would be mandated to do a townwide assessment. Um, our numbers are just not there, and we're not expected to be there anytime soon. Um, however, if the select board were to decide that we wanted to go down the route of having a townwide assessment, a reassessment performed, the results of that reassessment could skew our existing numbers so that it could cut down considerably the amount of time that we were state mandated to do it another reassessment and then at that point we would have to do it again. So if the board today decided let's do it, whatever the cost, um, and the numbers came back and skewed our estimates of, that we have at the moment, then we would within the next year or two have to perform another reassessment mm -hmm. at our own cost. Um, again at our own cost. So essentially we would pay twice for the same work. Um, mm. So. Uh, at this time, we have $189,000. A townwide reassessment would be anywhere between $250,000 to $300,000. Um, but the yeah. general advice that you know, we'd like to share with the board is that we should not perform one because we could essentially put ourselves in a place where we'd have to pay for a second one within a shorter period of time. We have some properties that folks are identifying are skewed, then those properties the listers could look at individually, right? That's right. And decide if, I mean, clearly if we have a lot of, if we identify some and they look at them all and they're like, oh, wow, you know, this has the same as some of others, then we probably have a bigger issue there than just some people thinking that their property is unfairly valued. Part of what people struggle to understand is the assessed value doesn't mean it's the market value. Mm -hmm. And I heard Sam continue to cross the two. Well, my assessed value isn't what the market value is. Well, first off, I would think his assessed value is nice to him because he seems to think his properties are fairly high above everything anyway. But, you know, the, the way the system works, they plug in what your house has for certain characteristics to it and it factors out the number is yeah. so that everybody kind of supposedly has the same playing field where i think we've got some issues on some of these is that the individual putting the data in took the liberty of claiming it to be of a higher value or a higher 
characteristic than what it is. But you know, I think if we could identify some that we think are skewed to have them look at, it would give us a better sense of whether it's really, you know, just seems to be coming up on a few or if it's across the board. Well, you have recent sales data to look against. So but maybe, that doesn't have any bearing no, 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 on no. it. The type of thing to take it, take the recent sales data situation and use some of those as some of those targets just to check out and see, okay, was that close to, I know it doesn't have any bearing, but it might be, but you've already got some transactions that have happened. Mm -hmm. Okay. You've also got some Main Street property here that I think is significantly overvalued because it's not selling. So for whatever reason, okay. And so, you know, if you were to get a cross section of maybe some residential stuff, some commercial stuff, those kind of things, you know, pick four or five target properties in those ranges. And, you know, maybe you could do some comparable data with just some selling prices, okay. Maybe that would be a good place to take a look and just to get a feeling of what's going on. Do we know what those properties, the <clears throat> town assessment is? Is it close to what the market is? Yeah, well, that's the question. So, but so we don't know. I mean, because right. but, but they don't really. They don't have to be close. No, they don't have to be right. close. So I mean, market conditions are determined are determined by a lot of different factors. It sounds like we're not going to do a town wide. Right, I don't know process. if we should. It sounds. It sounds like we're not really ready for that. For the reasons that Adolfo just identified, and and then if there's particular properties that um, are not paying their fair share, are paying more than their fair share, then we, we have an existing process, right, for for working that out, don't we? Like, isn't that what? Like, can, you can you can go you can to agree the, it. yeah. Yeah. Yes. So that's that's mm -hmm. that's the way we handle it. I'm, I'm not sure what, why we're talking about it. Because there's a lot of conversation out there right now by folks who feel like there's widespread there's discrepancies issues with how certain properties were put into the system based on how the individual felt about you as a person. Right. And so that's can't, how do we know that? On a case by case basis, if they but you don't know who what they all are. Only if they appeal it and you know? then it's reviewed, you're not going to go do it just because you feel like doing it. So if they appeal their value, then we would take a closer look at it. But right, right. But how else could we do it unless we go and do it for every single property? And that's what the request is. Right, but it sounded like we were saying that that's not a reasonable thing for us to well, do. Well, it's not a reasonable thing if we have to pay for it again in two years. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. But then we don't. But there's no need for us to have one done for a while, correct? Right. I Isn't mean, there's. The, I mean, that's other than a request from the community. Mm -hmm. But doesn't the isn't the the assessed values and are there and then what they're selling for on the market comes through and then property valuation looks at how close they are, right? Which gives us that factor number. And when they get to where the spread is too great, that's mm -hmm. when it triggers. Right. So whether, I guess I disagree that doing one now is going to make us have to do another one in a year because we should be, if we do an assessment, it should be putting us closer to what the market value is across the board. So we would have, we should be erasing any difference. Yeah. Well, in well typically the process that. seems to work in reverse because if you go back and you look at the data that was compiled in 2006, the grand list value at that time, you don't quote me on this, but I thought it was in the vicinity of 24 million. Okay? Could be higher than or 200, that. Maybe it was, I don't know, it was 24, yeah. Anyways, so, but then the value after the assessment went to 40 or 400, whatever it was. I can't remember. But anyways, it's... There's this huge discrepancy, but it's because property values at that point had increased dramatically. The argument now is, is what we're hearing about is, is the property values are not increasing. A lot of these properties are selling for less or can't be sold for what the town has them assessed for. That's the complaint that I'm hearing. Right. right? So if we true it up, which is what a townwide assessment is to do, mm -hmm. then we should be closer to what the market value is. We would so think our so. variation should be at zero. And we still get to go to like eight or nine percent, yeah. and we're at three, I think now. 
right? It's around 3%. Uh, so, so we're 14. So I understand the argument, but if we're at 3% off, doesn't that kind of confirm that we're, we're decent but, but numbers right we're now? Not. I mean, so some, so I, mean, I just, you know. It does, and I think it's, if uh, those individuals who, I think a lot of us know who we are, um, feel like he, it wasn't assessed, it's easy to call Ed and say, hey, can you look at this property and see what you guys come up with for a value of it? And if they come up different, they can change it themselves mm -hmm. for the April 1 of the year. You don't have to go through abatement. But Ed told me that in order to change some of these that seem to be in question here, you've got to have a sale in that region that shows that there's a significant difference. So to Trini's point, um, or to speak to add to Trini's point earlier, it is all formula based. Yeah, and, it is. You know, going through one of our current appeals and learning about the steps mm -hmm. that our listeners are going through, it is does it meet this criteria? And if it does, how? Does it meet this criteria? Does it does, how? So a lot of it is that very just cut and dry, punching in a formula, putting in an amount or a, a variance or whatever reason, and that's what it is. There could be a lot of just displeasure with costs in general and people are transferring that displeasure to their property tax and their value and how their property was assessed but you know, there could be issues there could not be issues it really depends on the property I think you're right Mike that that if we're at three percent right now it shows that we're pretty close yeah overall I agree in what's I going think on there's there. certain areas though that it's, we're not that's what I'm hearing I mean it seems like you know, uh, some of the property owners on a property on Main Street feeling like they get, they're getting hammered. Then maybe a few of them should ask Ed to look at it. Yeah, well, then maybe what that, would they that's, value that it might be today, the and and the listers themselves can change it if they feel it is. Mm -hmm. And even if the board did want to perform a town-wide assessment prematurely before it's state mandated, we. We're not even, we're not projected to have sufficient money. I think we're shy. The 523, yeah. Right. We'd be shy. We would have to increase our taxation and um, in order to get to that amount of money. I think so. you look at the, I think, you know, you take those isolated cases, look at the ones that seem to have a problem, apply the formula, see what happens. Yeah. See if they're, see if they're legit or not. Okay. So I guess from, is there only one person that enters that data? Is it only Ed at this point now? Well, there's Ed and Lisa. Ed and Lisa. Do they do it in in parallel, or is that one will go enter some, then another one could go enter some? I mean, to, to you know, if we're concerned about maybe in the past having one person enter the state and it being steered <laughs> steered in different directions because of opinions, is a checks and balances warranted to have a second person as a you could do that. Even As then, a, it yeah. could have been uh, that checks and balance, but I think the, the knowledge was skewed so that the person entering the information was seen as having a wealth of it, and the other people in the office did feel confident in that ability or their ability to check that, that power, that authority. Removing that person uh, makes it more of a checks and balance system, so they can both work together as <coughs> they do. Uh, one enters information, the other enters information, but they both can check each other's work because they feel that they can, whereas before, it was just a different power dynamic in that office. Okay. Well, I guess I'm hearing, don't rush out to put an RFP out. <laughs> oh, yeah. that, but, yeah. Okay. Let's see if we can target a couple of them and have them look at it and see what comes out of it. Okay. okay. Revisit it if we have to. All right. Reviewing the reclassification and discontinuance process. Uh, I thought I would revisit with the board the list of roads that um, have made it uh, uh, onto the existing list of potential safety issues that the town is evaluating. Um, uh, these are the roads listed here, um, broken down by geographic territory, East Randolph, Randolph Center, and the town. Um, the labeling may be a little different. There's some roads that are 
in the East Randolph category that have addresses in Randolph Center, so they're just crossing the roads in the area. But that's more of a tangential fact. Um, the current process is set so that the select board is going to visit uh, these grouping of roads uh, on certain days. Immediately after that, it, there's required to be a hearing so that residents can have an additional method of communication with the select board. Um, after the hearing is held, the select board has a minimum of 30 day wait period, but no more than a 60 day period to render a decision on the roads that were visited. Um, there is one road on here that I would like to point out that we since learned uh, um, should most likely not be on, included in the list, uh, and that would be Palmer Road. Um, through my search, uh, I did an aerial search and review of the road itself, and I, I had tree coverage, and I didn't see an actual bridge on the road. Um, converting a class three road to a class four would then eliminate any state aid that would be available to maintaining that road, and that bridge itself would be potentially costly. Um, this is one that we just redid the bridge on. It's like a $1.3 million project, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. um, I checked with the state on this, and there is no rule on the books today that you can't get the grant, redo the bridge, and then turn it to class four and walk away. However, there is one coming, and it's because they want to make sure that once they invest that money, that the town is actually maintaining the bridge that's been constructed. So I think it's right to remove that one, because even if we go through the process and change it to a class four, they're going to make us change it back to a class three to, to keep that bridge up anyway. Mm -hmm. There's also two others on this list that are with that one. Um, Blue Goose and Clay White both have hydrants on them that are uh, accessed for fire protection. And the, I know the grant for Blue Goose says that the town will continue to maintain that road. I, I'm not sure on Clay White because I believe that hydrant got put in before Troy Dare's grant program came through. Um, but the town did participate and provided all the equipment to put that in. Mm -hmm. um, so those two, I think we're going to, we would have a hard time changing those. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I have had a stream of residents come in with their letters, um, some varying of concern. Um, I think there was just some an initial just shock of what was in the letter itself. Because once we talked through the process, there was less of a fear and more of just a general frustration with what was happening. Um, I explained to them the safety issue, the, the process that the town would have to go through if some of our plow drivers have reported a safety issue that we can't ignore that complaint. We have to go through the process, investigate, which is why the select board would be going and seeing these roads firsthand. Um, most people understood. Again, they, they still were a little just frustrated, but they understood the requirement in the process. Um, so, I do think on both uh, Blue Goose and on Clay White, it's worth the site visit to look at whether there's some improvements that could be made, mm -hmm. not necessarily on the town's side completely, but some on the property owners um, to make it easier for them to get in there. Yeah. So do you have a, <clears throat> in all these roads, mm -hmm. they're all on there. So is there a safety concern list for each road? That's the issue here? Uh, yes, so I, I'm not a morning person, but I've made it a habit on a regular basis to you go. Drive around the morning with the, the <laughs> No, not go to the roads, but oh. meet with the highway crew and meet with water, wastewater, whenever, right before they get oh, up okay. and going. Uh, during one of my visits to Highway, my last visit to Highway, uh, roughly about three weeks ago, I asked them, we're going into snowplow operation season. Um, I told them that I would be holding a meeting with Highway Superintendent, grounds and uh, buildings and the key people. And at that point I said, what are your concerns? What are your worries about snowplowing because I want it to be more efficient and effective? And that's when they started telling me about some other issues. Um, 
I came back to the office, I have a very large road map, brought it back, took, took it to them, and we started circling all the roads that they thought they had issue with um, for any number of reasons. Um, so some of them we looked at and said, okay, well, maybe that's not quite a safety issue. Uh, others, some of our highway drivers were very adamant about it being a safety issue. So we left it on the list. Okay. And that's Is this how because of changes in use of equipment? Because I know that you know we've now purchased ten wheelers, so yeah. and we used to plow all these roads with single axle dump trucks. Yeah. So now that's a concern, right? Exactly. Because now it's taking more space to turn them around. Mm -hmm. So that's where, okay. Well, that's why I volunteered to go on all the looks because I want to see what they're dealing with. Thank you. I think some of them is, but some of these are, are uh, holdovers. And I had a chance to talk to somebody that worked for the town years ago who was telling me that the town originally started plowing some of these roads because it was the only way the milk trucks could get through. Right, exactly. And in some cases, we're still plowing. Yep. And there's no milk truck. And there's no milk truck anymore. Um, you know, this one, Tedford Drive, is literally a driveway. It's yeah. the width of one vehicle. Yeah. And we can't get any truck on it. Yeah. I know how that so we came take to and bring the loader from Randolph yeah. Center. No, and we know. drive the loader to the Chelsea Mountain Road to go up and plow that driveway. I have no idea how that one occurred, but I, have, I remember when it happened. I think it was who was living in the town, yeah, the so. town manager. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Could very well be. All right, well, anyways, I said that's why I volunteered to go on all of them, so I want to see what's going on. And I do have one request. Um, the notices went out. Um, they went out uh, for certain dates. Um, we've since had a change of schedule, and on one day, we have two or three, uh, so we don't have a quorum on a day. And so if there is someone available on November 2nd between 1 and 5 that isn't already scheduled to make it there, um, or be a part it's of that. Friday. Yeah. We'd love to have I guess end up on you travel. Yeah. You don't have a quorum on that day? Not I yet. thought we had we, it. We did, but we no we bailed. Did. I bailed. <laughs> I had travel. <laughs> you travel day. I could go if you want. <laughs> to your trip. And you can. I had, uh, like in Florida. These are on the first and the second. Is that uh, correct? That's right, first and second. The first is from 9 to uh, roughly 1. Both will end before the scheduled time. Um, no no earlier than an hour of the scheduled time. So yeah, from one, day, one to time. about 4. Yeah, first and second, right? November so first we're both second. on both days. I was just looking November at my calendar. I thought I was on so the one which you need a quorum for? So November 2nd. November 2nd. Are you going with us on the 1st? <clears throat> I'm going on the 1st. I can do the first, I can't do the second. At least on the second. And the time is again? It's one, one to one. five p.m. But you don't think it'll go to five? No, we're roughly ending, the schedule that I have now tentatively has us ending roughly about 4.15. Do you have to have an assigned said? time at each location? Yeah. The first was one to five? Yeah. October 15. Yeah. A nine 15 to one. Yeah. Oh, the first one, because I have the first one, though. yeah, nine to one. Nine to one. That one should end, I believe that one ends roughly about 12, 30. Right. And the second one was 1 to 5. 1 to 5. And then 1 on the second. Okay. Yeah. And I'm going to be driving everyone along so we can make sure to stay on track, schedule-wise. I don't yeah, know that you'll have that. enough room. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm going to ride the truck so I don't get stuck over here. <laughs> she won't be able to turn around either. <laughs> I can, not bet. <laughs> Um, on the first, if we have, uh, if we have uh, Mike, Matt, Perry, and you, we can. Uh, I'd be a little cramped in the town car. Yeah, if we had more than. But I can the take my. Yeah. I'll, I can take my truck. There'll be enough room. Okay. <laughs> in that one. I can actually climb in and get around the girls to maneuver their car seats and whatnot. It's great. <laughs> Can't park downtown, but I can. <laughs> All right, so we're good on that then? Good. Did we have somebody on the second? Between one and I'm, four? I'm not sure if I can. I'm going to have to try and get back to you tomorrow. Okay. Okay. 
the right agenda development? Uh, that's just a part of the, uh, the ongoing conversation with the select board. If there's anything in particular that um, any member of the board <coughs> wish to discuss with other members of the board um, and or provide additional direction to the town manager, uh, be willing to listen. I have something. I had a, a resident say that she has a hard time finding out when meetings are and being notified about them and that and her idea was that all our Warren meetings should be close to the front porch forum, but there's other communities that do that and that would be really helpful to know when things are. Mm -hmm. uh, but that sounds like a great idea because you might not want to go to the library over and over and over again for that one meeting, you know, that you might be interested in but don't know about ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So but if it comes through your front porch forum feed every day, you're looking at it anyway. I think you have to manually go in and yeah, post it every day. Our... For a front porch forum. Yeah, I yeah. don't think you can say post this thing for the next five days kind of thing. You uh -huh. can somebody's go and edit every single day. Right. But, but we're, I mean, as long as we're meeting the legal requirements in other ways, this would just be an additional way to get. Oh, stuff agreed. Out. I'm just saying, how do you know they're going to check it on Monday? Oh, you don't, you, don't, you don't know when somebody, a particular person, is checking them. I mean, when I, I mean, I'm on front porch forum, I, I read everyone that comes through. Um, so. Yeah. How often we post a particular, I mean, I was assuming we would just post one once on Front Porch Forum when you're sort of doing all the, 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 the warnings in general, that just the, one of the things you do is you take it and you just throw it up on Front Porch Forum. Can I speak to that? Um, yeah. Because uh, I post a lot of the meetings on the website. Um, was she having trouble accessing the website? The website didn't come up. Okay. Um, because... Um, we're, I'm working on the website with yeah. some other people, and I feel like um, that's a really good place for people to go now to right. see when meetings are happening. Cause it's sure. How many clicks to get to the calendar for the meetings? Uh, Two. One. Well, so it comes up to the front page and click like on a calendar? You have to scroll over a heading and then go down right. and click on yeah, town meeting good. calendar. Yeah. The so thing that's nice about Front Porch Forum, though, is if you're already somebody who is checking Front Porch Forum all the time because it shows up in your email box, and there's all sorts of things of interest there on a regular basis that you want to look at, then it just comes up. It's just it's just in front of you as a matter of course. Whereas if it's on the website, then you have to make a, an effort to think. Oh, I wonder if there's anything I want to look at that are meetings on the website, and you have to actually go there. And it just didn't, it just puts it in front of people's faces in a way. Get, but I don't see that's any different than the paper. Didn't we get approached mm -hmm. by them about if we they wanted money from the town to do that? I know that they have regular fundraising requests. Leaf um, bags. I yeah, important. and I think they, on a more official um, government request, was made early last summer, just as I was coming aboard, or right before I came aboard, for a rather hefty amount. I think it was eight, ten thousand dollars. I don't remember the exact amount, but yeah. I'd like to see us go to more electronic uh, notification. Uh, you know, having to post something and then have somebody run to East Randolph to put it up. I think we could find easier, but I don't think we should just do it. I think we need to look at. What about like an electronic mailing? So if somebody comes into the website, they put their email address in there, and that's how they get to know. My current service front porch forum is it's for people your age, right, and older probably, right? Does a 25, 30 year old do they get reached? So maybe, maybe not. So then we get to put it on Facebook or Pinterest or mm -hmm. Twitter or Chapsnet or whatever it is, you know. And then there's and, some that still read the paper. And there's some right. So how do we, you know, where do we, really I, I agree with getting it out there, but I'm wondering if there's a way we can just have people log in, sign up. And then they get an alert when when you add it to the calendar, just pumps it out there. Yeah, you basically subscribe to the calendar. Subscribe right, to the calendar. Subscribe to the calendar. So I mean, <clears throat> you can do that. I don't know. If anybody's yeah. interested, they can subscribe to the calendar, and then they get the notifications. And you can filter. I'm interested in DRB or select board or whatever. And they're already you know. working on the website anyway, so maybe that's mm -hmm. a thing you can add on. You got a question up there? Sorry. No, no, I like it. Just a second. I'm done. Sorry. Okay. Yep. As an individual, I think front porch limits how many times you can post per week or per month. I don't know if they would do something differently for the town, but that would be, if you go front porch, that's 
something to look at. Yeah. Maybe that's why they, like, they would do it for a fee or something. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's why it's fee-based. There was, we looked into that because I remember Jerry Ward was involved in that and researching it and it was the, the cost of it was prohibitive. But you, what your idea though that would be would be some initial setup, but once it's going, once it's going should be easy. Mm -hmm. The thing we'd have to deal with is when people change their emails and it bounces back, but great filter spam gone. Okay. Okay. We can look into it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's like more work. <laughs> <laughs> the development Great idea. <laughs> Anything else? You check in front page for him to see what else you got? <laughs> no, I just I'm trying to keep some notes on that, that things I might want to talk about. I have some other questions, but I think they're more about going to be more appropriate during the manager's report. Okay. okay. Animation infrastructure grant. This is a grant that came to our attention, um, a, a member of the select board. And after looking into it, it was it is a grant that's available that would allow the town to uh, have a more artistic approach, either installing a, an art sculpture or um, updating a mural or anything that the town could pay through this grant, pay an artist to do some work. Um, there were a number of different ideas that came to my mind when I thought of this, or when I, this came to my head. One of them was an artistic looking guardrail um, along Railroad Street, because then the grant would pay for it. Um, there were some issues with that particular option, so then we thought, well, our mural can use some touching up. We could apply for the grant to potentially update or touch up our mural, or if there are any other artistic <coughs> options that the select board had in terms of recommendations, you know, we could apply for the grant. Can you help me understand what how animation translates directly to art? Um, for some reason, it's it's referred to that way, uh, mm -hmm. the grant itself, uh, or the title of it, but really is just more of bringing art to government infrastructure, or just infrastructure in general. Um, bringing it to uh, have it displayed and pe people see it as more of a uh, incorporation of art into everyday life. Um, I don't know that I don't recall the nexus of why it's yeah, just yeah, curious. But, uh, but I do know that the grant itself would cover the artist's time and their work and would go towards paying for this type of activity. I don't have any specific projects in mind. Um, the only one that really came up was the guardrail, but that wasn't really going to work with this grant. And the other one was our mural that we faded. Mm -hmm. Another mural at the skating rink. So the question is whether you should pursue it or what are you? What do you if think? If you would authorize, uh, if the select board would authorize me to investigate and if we have a project to apply for it. And I really thought this was something to do with like Alice in Wonderland type buildings or bridges <laughs> or something. Well, I was thinking like you know, light shows or some animation, right? Light shows or something that would bring <laughs> something to the, to the <laughs> be scene or the holiday parade or whatever we're calling it. Or, it could. The, I was just trying to the list of projects that were listed on as having been funded is a broad spectrum. It could be a short-term display, it could be a long-term display, it could be a mural, it could be um, one of the items I had looked at was a rather large art display in an intersection, one of the large ones, so as people drive over it, they see this big thing on the ground. Um, the grant is really just, the requirements are that funding for this grant all of it would be used to pay the artist and the materials to bring the art to life. So when you should reach out to the arts people in the community and find out what they think should happen. Mm -hmm. Like River Press. Could be another yeah, sculpture Center, on any, your anything, trail. Huh? Could, be, could be another sculpture on your trail. Yeah, it could be anything. Could be yeah, could be something. And I'd well, I'd yeah, say church. check in with that. I mean we have advanced animations down the road from us, right? Mm -hmm. That does 
Um, true animation. So, true animation, <laughs> right? <laughs> Maybe they'd have some ideas for LED, right? I mean, they have another local company supporting them to use some of their product or something out there, oh, building a new building and promoting their business. And I mean, I know they did the street lights or whatever, but yeah. I don't know. Maybe they have some thoughts we could use. I'd say go, go dig yeah. it up, see what you can find. I think if, if the board were open to it, I could find some options, share them with the board through email, get yeah. a vote yeah. through email, and then ratify it later sure. on. Okay. I'm good with that. Okay. Firefighter assistance grant. This is FEMA. Uh, yes, there. There's some items that we could. Big sigh of something. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's, some, uh, there's some needs. Uh, I don't know at the moment if the needs that have been reported to the town is something that the select board would be willing to pursue at the moment. And one of those needs is a new apparatus, a new vehicle for uh, fire station in East Randolph. But if the select board would be willing to authorize me to look into it, and if we were to meet the criteria for potentially obtaining a grant for a new fire truck, uh, we could pull the grant together, share it with the board before we actually applied for it, or try to find out what other purchases are out there that we could make use of this grant for. We have been told the last two times that we applied for a truck that we have too many trucks in Randolph that the size of the area covered and the population and the type of structures, they just eliminate us. Because it's the summation right of all off. three departments, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We do really well going for gear or training funds. Mm -hmm. But those, but... We do, well, we do have a... We've had a, an ongoing conversation mm -hmm. of uh, tabletop exercise, full mobilization in the spring, um, we could potentially apply for reimbursement for this townwide training for all the firefighters for salaries, equipment use air packs if we have to use them. They like it to have more than one town mm -hmm. involved. So if you could pull if you pulled in all the mutual aid towns mm -hmm. on that and you know, maybe state police and the sheriffs and different folks like that, dirt. Um they eat that up. Another opportunity is we have this other fire truck that the town purchased with a compressed air foam system on it that, you know, there's only a few people that know how to use it. Mm -hmm. And that foam to run it through the truck, that foam's expensive to purchase. So, you know, getting other departments trained up on that system and the capabilities of that system may be advantageous. Get Do reimbursed you, for the foam costs and all that other stuff. Is there, um, when you look at the training for the different folks in the three departments. Is there a gap in there? Do you have enough people that need certain types of training to put a program together? This is my opinion. <laughs> I think every department trains differently and there's different certifications required by each department. So there's definitely gaps in there. And I think that um, whatever you know, we can do to bring departments together to try to train together would be a benefit to the town on all kinds of things. So one of the things we talked with them about year. a few years ago was a, uh, so you have firefighter one and you have firefighter two and the typical trainings that are held. And the problem with those is uh, the state controls that training and they're gonna do a certain number of them every year mm -hmm. and they don't have the capacity in trainers to do more. So trying to get your own firefighter one or firefighter two certification trainings is not really worth it. You're better off to lobby them to have a location near you, but there's other trainings that folks benefit from. And if you could put a piece it together somehow, they, they like the grants to be at least 25,000 that you're applying for. So, uh, and they love to throw those out to the rural parts of the country. And now that we have the station, um, we, we, the village fire department has had serious conversations about hosting firefighter one, firefighter two classes locally, as well as some of the advanced ones. I mean, you look at Lamoille Valley, you know, the, the school that they have up there and we send several folks each 
uh, each year to those schools for pump operator training, smoke, reading smoke, whatever. So getting having the facilities now and hosting those would be a huge advantage to Central Vermont and our, you know, I think our mutual aid. Mm -hmm. So it might be worth looking at what types of them would you like to do and, right. and, we have and what's that budget look like. One person that's now an instructor on our fire department, we're looking to get some more mm -hmm. certified instructors. Um, so I could potentially reach out to all the, our chiefs through email, ask them to work together, come up with a few options, and for the next fire advisory meeting, we could potentially have options to discuss. Do you have enough time? Aren't those due They're in October? Due in October 30th, I believe. So yeah. we would have. You already met a short this month, didn't you? Fire advisory. They did. Yeah. So it's not going to work to do it through fire advisory. No. I could just speak with all the chiefs personally and just say let's get together. They did discuss the AFG um, at one point, but we're deferring to East Randolph to see if they were going to apply for their truck. And because they didn't, I think they feel like they missed the boat anyway already. Yeah, I just don't. We're not going to get a truck through that process. They were pretty clear with us. Even after the fire, they wouldn't consider a truck. They told us we could move equipment around. So it, it takes a fair amount of effort to put that grant together. Mm -hmm. But I think you could do it for some trainings and make them regional and, okay. and get that pretty easy. I could do that. At the facility, it seems like you ought to do it. Yeah. Okay. Accessibility modification grant for Kimball. Uh, Kimball's director is working on implementing several ADA uh, compliant items. Um, she needs to make several upgrades, some that are required, uh, one of them being, it wasn't initially a part of the, the, the project, but one of them being uh, the bathroom upgrades. Currently not up to code. Uh, the biggest project that um, Amy's looking to have completed is upgrading the lift that she currently has. Um, it's old, it's making noises that it shouldn't be making. It's still operational, but she fears that it may not be very soon. Um, I asked Amy to speak with um, Nathan Cleveland, our contact with the CDBG program, and the person who also manages the accessibility modification grant program uh, that led to Amy being interested in applying for an accessibility modification grant. Uh, so she created the sheet, asked me to bring it in front of the board. The challenge is that we don't have money budgeted for these repairs and there is a considerable match that is required through the accessibility modification grant. There are also some pre-construction engineering that needs to take place that we also have not budgeted for. And much of the cost is being projected or being passed on from the library to the town. Um, I would find it very challenging with our current budget to fund what is being requested of the town at this point. Um, without taking away from other projects that have money budgeted for them for either this year or the next year or year after. We do have the benefit of, what I've suggested to Amy is if she would like to go out for special appropriations, she you know, would be able to do that to obtain these funds. Um, we could also go through the budget process, but again, that would be uh, an increase in tax um, to the tax base every year. So. So we're talking ten grand cost the town zone Yeah. Okay. With a five hundred dollar commitment from library trustees. It says I'm prepared to commit more. <clears throat> so maybe they could figure out what what they really feel like they can raise and then I kind of like the idea of it being special appropriations that the 
Yeah, me too. Uh, I'll let the, the voters decide. I'd be up for that one. Well, how do you, how, I mean, they get a sizable budget mm -hmm. to begin with. They can't find this in that budget. One of the challenges that I had during our conversation was that the library trustees were willing to commit a $500 match. And that was it. Uh, which is why I suggested the special appropriations because you leave it up to the voters, they can decide. Um, and it wouldn't pass the library's needs onto the town just for the sake of the library not wanting to make this a part of their own budget. Have they ever gone out and done a fundraiser? They do fundraisers. Um, I believe the last one was during the summer. The library uh, had a book sale. They, they book raised, sales, yeah. Yeah, roughly about $3,000. We have been trying to find for the library a space where they could sell their used books on a regular basis because at three thousand dollars to me it sounded like a wonderful thing if we could do it on a regular basis. Um, so we reached out to businesses, businesses in the in the village that are either vacant or are renting for different reasons, and asking them to have the library volunteers have a free bookstore uh, so they can sell the books and capture that revenue for the library. It's still a work in progress. We haven't received any positive responses yet. Why are they working with Chandler? Can they do like a capital Gallery. campaign? Yeah. yeah. They could do that too. Yeah. So the worn screw that's on that lift that's loud now or bearing, whatever it is, do they know how much that repair costs? I saw the $1,600 of repairs today and they said that they're screw is loud but safe right now yeah so assuming that goes sometime is that a 500 dollars fix or a i don't remember the number but i <coughs> seemed confident that she had the amount and i don't recall off the top of my head mm -hmm. and then i'd wonder what the usage is of that lift annually right? I mean, to spend twenty thousand dollars for it to be used twice mm -hmm. in a year or something versus just repairing it to keep it functional for the once or twice yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know the usage. I do know that applying for an accessibility modification grant through this program will not hurt the town for other CDBG grants that we are seeking to potentially apply in the short term. It would be considered separate, but that's just more information to share with the board. Mm -hmm. I would encourage them to create a capital campaign, and I know somebody's got an uncle that would love to contribute to him if they'd quit drinking his coffee. <laughs> you think? <laughs> he told me that. Yeah, no, I'm sure he would. I'm sure he Tell her to make a pot of coffee and go over and see Marshall Armstrong. Sure she's got time. Okay. Armstrong modification agreement. This is um, follow up to a previous decision the board had made to authorize town staff to seek a modification to RACDC's Armstrong, mod uh, Armstrong Mobile Home Park project. Uh, the board had previously voted to authorize me to seek the modification. We have since learned that the town was offered the modification of $144,000. So I informed the state that we can't just complete the application until the board authorized me to accept the money. And so that's why I put it on there. Need a motion to accept this one. Uh, is that, is yes. that it? Do we believe this will do the project finally? Well, yes. or is it having a bit of inside information on this? <laughs> the owner of the construction company died, and they're now looking for a new contractor. 
because all of his equipment is in probate court. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah, there's, you can't make up most of the stuff that's happened on this project. But it looks like they are very close to figuring it out. I don't know if they have yet, but it's very close. Ability to tell on this, is there? No. Well, yes. Well. We keep hearing no, but that's not true. Every time the town signs for one of these grants, we are ultimately responsible for that grant. So, should they something happen or there be a hiccup, the town's the one that gets to pay this back. <clears throat> so, if they list five things on there and they only complete four for that dollar amount. Mm -hmm. That fifth item would have to be completed under the town's expense. Well, um, it. What we would end up doing is then sitting down with Commerce mm -hmm. and our ACDC and saying, okay, this is what happened, this is where we're at, and figuring out what makes that correct. If they got into the project and they found that reimbursement had been sought for an item that was not eligible, and it was $20,000, say, the town would be the one asked to get the $20,000 back. We would then go to them, but if they couldn't pay it, the town would be the one having to, to make that up. These grants aren't always, they're, none of them that we sign for are we clear of any liability or anything. We're the ones signing and we're the responsible party for the money and what takes place in the grant. So we are the back yeah. <clears throat> So there was some alluding to this time. Are they going to finish? I mean, did they get a grant before to do some work and then they didn't finish underneath that grant? Or This one is the second amendment to the original grant. It's upwards of over $700,000 now that they've been, that this project has uh, received through this, this particular state project. Once, once we accept this. Once, once this if the board accepts it, yes. This is, but this isn't thousand. the only money they've received. No, there's 1.5 million total in this project. And some of the needs for additional monies came from an application for other funding sources that required additional engineering and additional assessments at a higher cost, which caused the project to go over. There are some other issues that were, were a little beyond their control, but for the most part, uh, this project has received a considerable amount of money. So what are they doing with this additional money? I mean, does it say any? I don't see it say that tasks one through five are going to be done here. Uh, this money is essentially to cover uh, additional engineering work that was needed. Um, Since higher water, wastewater costs yeah. from the original estimate. They're on, those are wells and septics up there, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The problem was, the original engineering people didn't realize how much ledger in the situation. So now they're having to deal with a lot more ledge than what they originally thought they had to do. There's some, there's some challenges on the state side about this project and the total cost. And our ACDC manages this mm -hmm. project? Mm -hmm. Can we get, maybe at our next meeting, a list of all the grants that the town is on the hook for for them and what that, what is our liability? <clears throat> that we have with them and their projects. I get a feeling it's substantial. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're on the hook for it because we've already acknowledged that we were going to do this, so. 
but there's nothing that prevents, you know, there could be overruns. Yeah. How does this project benefit the town? <laughs> How's it what? Benefit the town. The initial thought was uh, it's the way the grants author uh, administered it, submitted through to the town. No, I understand it's through the town, but the liability, if it goes on the town, what is it? What is the benefit to the town? It was just a to, lower income housing type. No, thing? it was supposed to build. It was supposed to expand on middle income housing. For the town, the more desirable income bracket that would bring in a certain type of resident to the town. Um, to the Armstrong trailer park? No. Um, but I don't I I don't I don't see it. I don't see it. But that was the intent was to create the way it was explained to me and the way I've, I've read it and interpreted it was to create middle income housing for the town. Long, yeah, there's a sweet spot. I don't know the range, but it was supposed to be middle income housing. This one's beyond my logic. Yep. <clears throat> in the meantime, in the we meantime. have 144,000 more in federal funds that have been offered by the state for this project. You're done with it, right? This hundred and forty-four thousand for their sewer fix will take it to a five hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars sewer improvement up there. For how many residences? Seventeen. You don't want to do the math. It's not. I'll give you a little overview at some point how this all works and why this is here. But That's okay. I just <laughs> it starts out with a state program that doesn't allow the owner to sell the mobile home park to anybody yeah, privately, okay, without it's having to go through a process. So that's the history of it. So, so whatever, you got <laughs> to move it forward here. Do what we need to do and move it. We uh, accept the grant agreement. I'll second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Old business. Um, one item that I moved as an update to the manager's report as opposed to old business is, well, there is no old business. I'll just talk about <laughs> Perfect. It. I was like, other business? Uh, yeah, report, sorry. Check that one out. <laughs> Any other business? I'll give you a little other business. I have something. Uh, hang on. Okay. Go ahead, Barry. So, um, it's just so you're aware of what's going on, in case anybody questions you or calls you. So, the Conservation Commission and I have been working on a little joint agreement on my newly acquired Fires Hill project. So, there's a strip of invasives that sits on the border. And so I've been talking with them about, you know, how do we get rid of that? What's the process? So over the last couple of weeks, I actually met with them in a meeting. They did a site visit, and it's my understanding that they contacted their forester and land trust, and everybody's okay with us mowing this strip. So that's what's probably going to happen unless for some reason you folks have an objection to it. So just cleaning up the border between myself and the, and the town property. So the discussion was that once we get rid of this, maybe we'd just jointly share and plant some maple trees or something along the border. It's on the property line. So that's where we're at. Nice. Okay. I need a hotel. It's work. I'm coming. It's, that's <laughs> on the agenda. I got people staying at my house. I know. It's happening. 
Oh, those wow. are called kids. No, those are called Polaris people. <laughs> there isn't so much business as it is. It's a franchise agreement of signing this week. $400 a night, 15 a month for your for hotel. Mm -hmm. Just, I mean. No, they actually oh, yeah. Did you want the other one? Mm -hmm. the There's an opportunity for you to have a little fun, and I'm just letting you know that um, Montpelier decided at their council meeting last week to go ahead with a trial um, program. It will be the first in Vermont. It's in about 50 communities nationwide. It started in 2017 and already has served over 10 million um, people with assistance in transportation. I happened to be on site when their police department and fire department and uh, town hall were checking out the, the uh, program. I'm mentioning it to you because starting Thursday, they are going to be putting these scooters up and around um, Montpelier for at least a month till the snow flies, however long that takes, and um, would encourage you to have fun. <laughs> um, it costs a dollar to start it up and a download on a, a phone app, and then for 15 cents a minute, um, you can use it to get yourself wherever. Um, it perked my attention because I have some connections to the restorative justice community and looking for job opportunities and quick assists. Um, and so I made mention of that to the um, Another Way program that they have up in Montpelier, which is similar to things that are happening around here in, in ways of trying to be an assist to people with needs in our community. So, but it's, it's not really just for that. It's for anybody, whoever, wherever, and have a little fun with an electric scooter instead of an electric car. <laughs> and, uh, and welcome to Paul. Um, I, so we, we've talked about some of the work that uh, Martha's done in the community, and she's really gone above and beyond what a lot of other people have done. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. So we appreciate her efforts. Uh, uh, on this particular project, I, I was just out of town this weekend and was in a city that hasn't had these scooters. And I'd never seen them before. It was new to me. I kept wondering why there's so many scooters everywhere. Um, they really were everywhere. And my family, who I was with, they knew about them because it's just, it's just a bigger project than I uh, and one of the challenges that I immediately saw and that they were telling me were a problem elsewhere is that there's no real place to return the scooters. People can leave them anywhere, and the app will direct people to where the scooters are, and you can just pick it up and go. Um, I saw some in bushes. They were kind of thrown in different places. Um, they were in parking lots in a parking stall. Um, I saw that there was a lack of regulation for them, um, which... I also saw was creating a problem. Not that's not to say that there isn't there is there are not some benefits to this, but what I immediately saw were younger people going onto the road without wearing a helmet and they were onto oncoming traffic. I saw I literally saw several in bushes that were just looked like it was trash. Um, so I, I only say that because I just saw them. <coughs> <coughs> they're, they're doing it as a trial. And um, they do pick them up every night. Mm -hmm. That's part of their program. They, they provide somebody to pick them up and re put, return them to um, centrally located mm -hmm. locations. They try out different locations, different evenings. And um, it, it's part of something, if you look at the other side of this, it has a letter talking about how it's really uh, an effort to mm -hmm. <clears throat> help cut back on our carbon uh, footprint processes as well. Um, so I, I'm mentioning it. Avail yourself of the opportunity to hear from Montpelier how their trial goes. And I, I have notes that I took at their council meeting that I'll eventually get to you, but I haven't processed them that yet for you. Um, they raised a lot of good questions, and I'm sure your comments will surface in some fashion, and I hope that they are able to successfully come up with um, <laughs> answers to them as well. So that would be interesting to watch. <clears throat> and I'll also comment another piece that I hope is somehow fit, addressed is that there's a need for car transportation for a lot of our people that, that um, need to get to appointments and different kinds of things like that too. 
So that's another piece that I'm exploring as well as something like this. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Any other business? Manager's report? I'll try to work through this as quickly as I can. Uh, the first is I uh, received a message from the Conservation Commission. Okay, I kind of stole my thunder a little bit. Sorry. Um, they had come to me uh, through email, I believe, and I believe it was TJ Riley, who mentioned that they uh, had no objections to the clearing. So um, it was just something that came to me last minute, and that's why it's on the agenda. But I wanted to share that during the manager's report. Um, the second item is uh, I'm still working with staff to uh, find answers to the board's questions about the swimming pool, uh, costs, life of repairs. Um, I do know that Marty met with Mike recently to work out the issues with the RFP, so we're moving along, and uh, I will put the item on the agenda as soon as we have more concrete answers for, okay. for you all. Um, we had an issue with the town plan. Uh, the issue was that uh, our regional planning commission chose to not pass the plan itself. And so uh, at the moment we have a town approved town plan. We do not have a regionally approved town plan. We've had conversations with state agencies um, regarding what that means to the town for municipal planning grants or for the downtown designation program. We have found that for the downtown designation program it, it wouldn't be a problem in the short term so long as the agency sees that we're still working toward a potential regional plan. They didn't say it had to be approved by the regional uh, regional planning commission anytime soon, but they did say they wanted to see some progress towards it. Um, in terms of municipal planning grants, we have not identified one that we we're going to apply for in the immediate future. But if we are to apply for one, it could be a potential problem for us if we don't have a regionally approved plan. Um, I've expressed my concerns to our Two Rivers Adequichi Regional Director, and it was, we're working on it, is the best thing. <laughs> it was frustrating. Yeah. Um, the Planning Commission did have a conversation with the gals last week. Did, when okay. We met with about this. So okay. they said that you were working on it, so we're going to leave it at that and mm -hmm. let you work on it. Okay. Um, well, actually, the, the end result was. Yes, we were in the room, mm -hmm. and yes, we helped with the edits, but that one paragraph on child care, child care sure. somehow yeah. got removed, and because it's not there, we're not approving your plan, yeah, even we though we know you're rewriting it, and we're sitting at the table helping you. We didn't know. I, no one even, we have no idea how that got admitted. Nobody knows. I mean, the, the girls were helping, and they were doing their part, and we were getting all these edits, and everything was coming back, and somebody punched delete, I guess. It's, it's an ongoing. It's absurd. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. it's it's bubbled up in that I received calls from state agency representatives asking about what what happened because they had been hearing from Peter Gregory on this particular issue from his perspective, and I said, "Gloves are coming off." I, you know, I, I told them what actually happened as opposed to what they're hearing. Um, I did also say to them that we could potentially explore asking our state representatives to introduce legislation that would diminish the authorities of the state of the regional planning commissions. I didn't say that's what we were going to do, but I have broached the subject. Yeah. You know, I've broached the subject with our state reps. Um, they you know they didn't have a response, but it's it's an option. The bigger grants don't require the plan to be regionally approved anyway. The only ones that we can find are the municipal planning grants mm -hmm. say that you'll develop a town plan that will be have regional approval. And that's it. Mm -hmm. So it's not hurting us not to have it. No. Which makes you wonder why you even need it. But Well, Morristown doesn't have it, so there's an example of a community that seems to be moving forward without without one. Without a, without a regional planning commission approval. Yeah, Anyways, anyway. Adolfo's working on it. <laughs>